Aunt Judy's Tales by Mrs. Alfred Gaddy by Margaret Gaddy Chapter One of The Little Victims Save our blessings, Master, save from the blight of thankless eye. Lyra in Ascentium There is not a more charming sight in the domestic world than that of an elder girl in a large family, amusing what are called the little ones. How could Mama have ventured upon that cosy nap in the armchair by the fire if she had been harassed by wondering what the children were about? Whereas, as it was, she had overheard Number 8 begging the one they all called Aunt Judy to come and tell them a story, and she had beheld Aunt Judy's nod of consent, whereupon she had shut her eyes and composed herself to sleep quite complacently, under the pleasant conviction that all things were sure to be in a state of peace and security, so long as the children were listening to one of those curious stories of Aunt Judy's, in which, with so much drollery and amusement, there was sure to be mixed up some odd scraps of information or bits of good advice. So, Mama being asleep on one side of the fire, and Papa reading the newspaper on the other, Aunt Judy and Number 8 noiselessly left the room and repaired to the large red curtain dining room, where the former sat down to concoct her story, while the latter ran off to collect the little ones together. In less than five minutes' time there was a stream of noise along the passage, a bursting open of the door, and a crowding round the fire by which Aunt Judy sat. The little ones had arrived in full force and high expectation. We will not venture to state their number. An order from Aunt Judy that they should take their seats quietly was but imperfectly obeyed, and a certain amount of hustling and grumbling ensued, which betrayed a rather quarrelsome tendency. At last, however, the large circle was formed, and the bright firelight danced over sunny curls and eager faces. Aunt Judy glanced her eye around the group, but whatever her opinion as an artist might have been of its general beauty, she was by no means satisfied with the result of her inspection. Number six and number seven, cried she, you are not fit to listen to a story at present. You have come with dirty hands. Number six frowned, and number seven broke out at once into a howl. He had washed his hands ever so short a time ago, and had done nothing since but play at knucklebones on the floor. Surely people needn't wash their hands every ten minutes. It was very hard. Aunt Judy had rather a logical turn of mind, so she set about expounding to the little ones in general, and to numbers six and seven in particular, that the proper time for washing people's hands was when their hands were dirty, no matter how lately the operation had been performed before. Such, at least, she said, was the custom in England, and everyone ought to be proud of belonging to so clean and respectable a country. She, therefore, insisted that numbers six and seven should retire upstairs and perform the necessary ablution, or otherwise they would be turned out and not allowed to listen to the story. Numbers six and seven were rather restive. The truth was, it had been one of those unlucky days which now and then will occur in families, in which everything seemed to be perverse and go askew. It was a dark, cold, rainy day in November, and going out had been impossible. The elder boys had worried, and the younger ones had cried. It was Saturday, too, and the maids were scouring in all directions, waking every echo in the back premises by the grating of sandstone on the flags, and they had been a good deal discomposed by the family effort to play at wolf in the passages. Mama had been at accounts all the morning, trying to find out some magical corner in which expenses could be reduced between then and the arrival of Christmas bills. And, moreover, it was a half-holiday, and the children had, as they call it, nothing to do. So numbers six and seven, who had been vexed about several other little matters before during the course of the day, broke out now on the subject of the washing of their hands. Aunt Judy was inexorable, however, inexorable though cool, and the rest got impatient at the delay which the debate occasioned. So, partly by coaxing, and partly by the threat of being shut out from hearing the story, number six and seven were at last prevailed upon to go upstairs and wash their grim little paws into that delicate, shell-like pink, which is the characteristic of juvenile fingers when clean. 
As they went out, however, they murmured in whimpered tones that they were sure it was very hard. After their departure, Aunt Judy requested the rest not to talk, and a complete silence ensued, during which one or two of the youngest evidently concluded that she was composing her story, for they stared at her with all their might, as if to discover how she did it. Meantime, the rain beat violently against the panes, and the red curtains swayed to and fro from the effect of the wind, which, in spite of tolerable woodwork, found its way through the divisions of the windows. There was something very dreary in the sound, and very odd in the varying shades of red which appeared upon the curtains as they swerved backwards and forwards in the firelight. Several of the children observed it, but no one spoke until the footsteps of numbers six and seven were heard approaching the door, on which a little girl ventured to whisper, I'm very glad I'm not out in the wind and rain. And a boy made answer, Why, who would be so silly as to think of going out in the wind and rain? Nobody, of course. At that moment, number six and seven entered, and took their places on two little derby chairs, having previously showed their pink hands in somber silence to Aunt Judy, whereupon Aunt Judy turned herself so as to face the whole group, and then began her story as follows. There were once upon a time eight little victims, who were shut up in a large stone building, where they were watched night and day by a set of huge grown-up keepers who made them do whatever they chose. Don't make it too sad, Aunt Judy, murmured number eight, half in a tremble already. You needn't be frightened, number eight, was the answer. My stories always end well. I'm so glad, chuckled number eight with a grin as he clapped one little fat hand down upon the other on his lap in complete satisfaction. Go on, please. Was the large stone building a prison, Aunt Judy? inquired number seven. That depends upon your ideas of a prison, answered Aunt Judy. What do you suppose a prison is? Oh, a great big place with walls all around, where people are locked up and can't go in and out as they choose. Very well. That I think you may be allowed to call the place in which the little victims were kept a prison, for it certainly was a great big place with walls all around, and they were locked up at night, and not allowed to go in and out as they chose. Poor things, murmured number eight, but he consoled himself by recollecting that the story was to end well. Aunt Judy, before you go on, do tell us what victims are. Are they fairies or what? I don't know. This was the request of number five, who was rather more thoughtful than the rest, and was apt now and then to delay a story by his inquiring turn of mind. Number six was in a hurry to hear some more, and nudged number five to make him be quiet. But Aunt Judy interposed, said she did not like to tell stories to people who didn't care to know what they meant, and declared that number five was quite right in asking what a victim was. A victim, said she, was the creature which the old heathens used to offer up as a sacrifice, after they had gained a victory in battle. You all remember, I dare say, continued she, what a sacrifice is, and have heard about Abel's sacrifice of the firstlings of his flock. The children nodded assent, and Aunt Judy went on. No such sacrifices are ever offered up now by us Christians, and so there are no more real victims now. But we still use the word, and call any creature a victim who is ill-used or hurt or destroyed by somebody else. If you, any of you, were to worry or kill the cat, for instance, then the cat would be called the victim of your cruelty. And in the same manner the eight little victims I am going to tell you about were the victims of the whims and cruel prejudices of those who had the charge of them. And now, before I proceed any further, I am going to establish a rule that whenever I tell you anything very sad about the little victims, you shall all of you groan aloud together. So groan here, if you please, now that you quite understand what a victim is. Aunt Judy glanced round the circle, and they all groaned together to order, led off by numbers three and four, who did not, it must be owned, look in a very mournful state while they performed the ceremony. 
It was wonderful what good that groan did them all. It seemed to clear off half the troubles of the day, and at its conclusion a smile was visible on every face. Aunt Judy then proceeded. I do not want to make you cry too much, but I will tell you of the miseries the captive victims underwent in the course of one single day, and then you will be able to judge for yourselves what a life they led together. One of their heaviest miseries happened every evening. It was the misery of going to bed. Perhaps now you may think it sounds odd that going to bed should be called a misery, but you shall hear how it was. In the evening, when all the doors were safely locked and bolted, so that no one could get away, the little victims were summoned downstairs and brought into a room where some of the keepers were sure to be sitting in the greatest luxury. There was generally a warm fire on the hearth and a beautiful lamp on the table, which shed an agreeable light around and made everything look so pretty and gay. The hearts of the poor, innocent victims always rose at the sight. Sometimes there would be a huge visitor or two present, who would now and then take the victims on their knees and say all manner of entertaining things to them, or there would be nice games for them to play at or the keepers themselves would kiss them and call them kind names, as if they really loved them. How nice all this sounds, does it not? And it would have been nice, if the keepers would but have let it last forever. But that was just the one thing they never would do, and the consequence was that, whatever pleasure they might have had, the wretched victims always ended up being dissatisfied and sad. And how could it be otherwise? Just when they were at the height of enjoyment, just when everything was most delightful, a horrible knock was sure to be heard at the door, the meaning of which they all knew but too well. It was the knock which summoned them to bed, and at such a moment you cannot wonder that going to bed was felt to be a misfortune. Had there been a single one among them who was sleepy, or tired, or ready for bed, there would have been some excuse for the keepers. But as it was, there was none, for the little victims never knew what it was to feel tired or weary on those occasions, and were always carried forcibly away before that feeling came on. Of course, when the knock was heard, they would begin to cry and say that it was very hard, and that they didn't want to go to bed, and one went so far once as to add that she wouldn't go to bed. But it was all in vain. The little victims might as well have attempted to melt a stone wall as those hard-hearted beings who had the charge of them. And now, my dears, observed Aunt Judy, stopping in her account, this is of all others the exact moment at which you ought to show your sympathy with the sufferers, and groan. The little ones groaned accordingly, but in a very feeble manner. Aunt Judy shook her head. That groan is not half hearty enough for such a misery. Don't you think if you tried hard you could groan a little louder? They did try, and succeeded a little better, but cast furtive glances at each other immediately after. Were the beds very uncomfortable ones, Aunt Judy? inquired number eight in a subdued voice. You shall judge for yourself, was the answer. They were raised off the floor upon legs so that no wind from under the door could get at them. And on the flat bottom called the bedstock, there was placed a thick, strong bag called a mattress, which was stuffed with some soft material which made it springy and pleasant to touch or lie down upon. The shape of it was a long square, or what may be called a rectangular parallelogram. I strongly advise you all to learn that word, for it is rather an amusing idea as one steps into bed to think that one is going to sleep upon a parallelogram. Numbers three and four were here unable to contain themselves, but broke into a peal of laughter. The little ones stared. Well, resumed Aunt Judy, for my part, I think it's a very nice thing to learn the ins and outs of one's own life, to consider how one's bed is made, and the why and wherefore of its shape and position. It is a great pity to get so accustomed to things as not to know their value till we lose them but to proceed. On the top of this parallelogrammatic mattress was laid a soft blanket. On the top of that blanket, two white sheets. On the top of the sheets, two or more warm blankets, and on the top of the blankets, a spotted cover called a counterpane. 
Now it was between the sheets that each little victim was laid, as such were the receptacles to which they were unwillingly consigned, night after night of their lives. But I have not yet told you half the troubles of this dreadful going to bed. A good fire with a large tub before it, and towels hung over the fender, was always the first sight which met the tearful eyes of the little victims as they entered the nursery after being torn from the joys of the room downstairs. And then, lo and behold, a new misery began, for, whether owing to the fatigue of getting upstairs, or that their feelings had been so much hurt, they generally discovered at this moment that they were one and all so excessively tired they didn't know what to do, of all things did not choose to be washed, and insisted, each of them, on being put to bed first. But let them say what they would, and cry afresh as they pleased, and even snap and snarl at each other like so many small terriers, those cruel keepers of theirs never would grant their requests, never would put any of them to bed dirty, and always declared that it was impossible to put each of them to bed first. Imagine now the feelings of those who had to wait round the fire while the others were attended to, Imagine the weariness, the disgust, before the whole party was finished and put by for the night. Aunt Judy paused, but no one spoke. What? cried she suddenly. Will nobody groan? That I must groan myself. Which she did, and a most unearthly noise she made, so much so, that two or three of the little ones turned round to look at the swelling red curtains just to make sure the howl did not proceed from thence. After which Aunt Judy continued her tale. So much for night and going to bed, about which there is nothing more to relate, as little victims were uncommonly good sleepers, and seldom awoke till long after daylight. Well now, what do you think? By the time they had had a good night, they felt so comfortable in their beds that they were quite contented to remain there. And then, of course, their tormentors never rested till they had forced them to get up. Poor little things! Just think of their being made to go to bed at night, when they most disliked it, and then made to get up in the morning when they wanted to stay in bed. It certainly was, as they always said, very, very hard. This was, of course, a winter misery, when the air was so frosty and cold that it was very unpleasant to jump out into it from a warm nest. Terrible scenes took place on these occasions, I assure you, for sometimes the wretched victims would sit shivering on the floor, crying over their socks and shoes instead of putting them on, which they had no spirit for, and then the savage creatures who managed them would insult them by irritating speeches. Come, Miss So-and-so, one would say, don't sit fretting there. There's a warm fire and a nice basin of bread and milk waiting for you, if you will only be quick and get ready. Get ready. A nice order indeed. It meant that they must wash themselves and be dressed before they would be allowed to touch a morsel of food. But it is of no use dwelling on the unfeelingness of those keepers. One day one of them actually said, if you knew what it was to have to get up without a fire to come to, and without a breakfast to eat, you would leave off grumbling at nothing. Nothing, they called it. Nothing to have to get out of a warm bed into the fresh morning air and dress before breakfast. Well, my dears, pursued Aunt Judy, after waiting here a few seconds to see if anyone would groan. I shall take it for granted you feel for the getting up misery as well as the going to bed one, although you have not groaned as I expected. I'll just add, in conclusion, that the summer getting up misery was just the reverse of this winter one. Then the poor little wretches were expected to wait till their nursery was dusted and swept, so there they had to lie, sometimes for half an hour, with the sun shining in upon them, not allowed to get up and come out into the dirt and dust. Of course, on those occasions they had nothing to do but squabble among themselves and tease, and I assure you they had every now and then a very pleasant little revenge on their keepers, for they half worried them out of their lives by disturbances and complaints, and at any rate that was some comfort to them, although very often it hindered the nursery from being done half as soon as it would have been if they had been quiet. I shall not have time to tell of everything, continued Aunt Judy so I must hurry over the breakfast, although the keepers contrived to make even that miserable, 
by doing all they could to prevent the little victims from spilling their food on the table and floor, and also by insisting on the poor little things sitting tolerably upright on their seats, not lolling with both elbows on the tablecloth, not making a mess, not, in short, playing any of those innocent little pranks in which young creatures take delight. It was a pitiable spectacle, as you may suppose, to see reasonable beings constrained against their inclinations to sit quietly while they ate their hearty morning meal, which really, perhaps, they might have enjoyed had they been allowed to amuse themselves in their own fashion at the same time. But I must go on now to that great misery of the day, which I shall call the lesson misery. Now you must know, the little victims were all born, as young kids, lambs, kittens, and puppy dogs are, with a decided liking for jumping about and playing all day long. Think, therefore, what their sufferings were when they were placed in chairs round a table, and obliged to sit and stare at queer-looking characters in books, until they had learned to know them what was called by heart. It was a very odd way of describing it, for I am sure they had often no heart in the matter, unless it was a hearty dislike. "'Tommy Brown in the village never learns any lessons,' cried one of them, once the creature who was teaching him. "'Why should I? He's always playing at oyster dishes in the gutter when I see him, and enjoying himself. I wish I might enjoy myself.' Poor victim. He little thought what a tiresome lecture this clever remark of his would bring on his devoted head. Don't ask me to repeat it. It amounted merely to this, that twenty years hence he would be very glad he had learned something else besides oyster dishes in the streets. As if that signified to him now. As if it took away the nuisance of having to learn at the present moment, to be told it would be of use hereafter. What was the use of its being of use by and by? So thought the little victim, young as he was. So, said he, in a muttering voice, I don't care about twenty years hence. I want to be happy now. This was unanswerable, as you may suppose. So the puzzled teacher didn't attempt to make a reply, but said, Go on with your lessons, you foolish little boy. See what it is to be obstinate, pursued Aunt Judy. See how it blinds people's eyes and prevents them from knowing right from wrong. Pray take warning and never be obstinate yourselves. And meantime, let us have a good hearty groan for the lesson misery. The little ones obeyed and breathed out a groan that seemed to come from the very depths of their hearts. But somehow or other, as the story proceeded, the faces looked rather less amused and rather more anxious than at first. What could the little ones be thinking about to make them grave? It was evidently quite a relief when Aunt Judy went on. You will be very much surprised, I dare say, said she, to hear of the next misery I am going to tell you about. It may be called the dinner misery, and the little victims underwent it every day. Did they give them nasty things to eat, Aunt Judy? murmured number eight, very anxiously. More likely not half enough, suggested number five. But you promised not to make the story too sad, remember, observed number six. I did, replied Aunt Judy, and the dinner misery did not consist in nasty food, or there not being enough. They had plenty to eat, I assure you, and everything was good. But... Aunt Judy stopped short, and glanced at each of the little ones in succession. Make haste, Aunt Judy, cried number eight, but what? But, resumed Aunt Judy, in her most impressive tone, they had to wait between the courses. Again Aunt Judy paused, and there was a looking hither and thither among the little ones, and a shuffling about on the small derby chairs, but one or two pairs of eyes were suddenly turned to the fire, as if watching it relieved a certain degree of embarrassment which their owners began to experience. It is not every little boy or girl, was Aunt Judy's next remark, who knows what the courses of a dinner are. I don't, interposed number eight, in a distressed voice, as if he had been deeply injured. Oh, you think not? Well, not by name, perhaps, answered Aunt Judy. But I will explain. The courses of a dinner are the different sorts of food, which follow each other one after the other, till dinner is what people call over. 
thus supposing a dinner was to begin with pea soup as you have sometimes seen it do you'd expect when it was taken away to see some meat put upon the table should you not the little ones nodded assent and after the meat was gone you'd expect pie or pudding eh they nodded assent again and with a smile and if after the pudding was carried away you saw some cheese and celery arise it would not startle you very much would it the little ones did nothing but laugh very well pursued aunt judy such a dinner as we have been talking about consists of four courses the soup course the meat course the pudding course and the cheese course and it was while one course was being carried out and another fetched in that the little victims had to wait and that was the dinner misery i spoke about and a very grievous affair it was sometimes they had actually to wait several minutes with nothing to do but to fidget on their chairs lean backwards till they toppled over or forward till some accident occurred at the table and then poor little things if they ventured to get out their knuckle-bones for a game or took to a little boxing amusement among themselves or to throwing the salt in each other's mugs or pelting each other with bits of bread or anything nice and entertaining down came those merciless keepers on their innocent mirth and the old stupid order went round for sitting upright and quiet nothing that i can say about it would be half as expressive as what the little victims used to say themselves they said that it was so very hard now then a good groan for the dinner misery exclaimed aunt judy in conclusion the order was obeyed but somewhat reluctantly and then aunt judy proceeded with her tale on one occasion of the dinner misery resumed she there happened to be a stranger lady present who seemed to be very much shocked by what the victims had to undergo and to pity them very much so she said that she would set them a nice little puzzle to amuse them till the second course arrived but now what do you think the puzzle was it was a question and this was it which is the harder thing to bear to have to wait for your dinner or to have no dinner to wait for i do not think the little victims would have quite known what the stranger lady meant if she had not explained herself for you see they had never gone without dinner in their lives so they had not an idea what sort of a feeling it was to have no dinner to wait for but she went on to tell them what it was like as well as she could she described to them little tommy brown whom they envied so much for having no lessons to do eating his potato soaked in the dripping begged at the squire's back door without anything else to wait or hope for she told them that he was never teased as to how he sat or even whether he sat or stood and then she asked them if they did not think he was a very happy little boy he had no trouble or bother but just ate his rough morsel in any way he pleased and then was off hungry or not hungry into the streets again to tell you the truth pursued aunt judy the victims did not know what to say to the lady's account of little tommy brown's happiness but as the roast meat came in just as it concluded perhaps that diverted their attention however after they had all been helped it was suddenly observed that one of them would not begin to eat he sat with his head bent over his plate and his cheeks growing redder and redder till at last some one asked what was amiss and why he would not go on with his dinner on which he sobbed out that he had much rather it was taken to little tommy brown that was a very good little victim wasn't he asked number eight but what did the keepers say inquired number five rather anxiously oh replied aunt judy it was soon settled that tommy brown was to have the dinner which made the little victim so happy he actually jumped for joy on which the stranger lady told them she hoped they would henceforth always ask themselves a curious question whenever they sat down to a good meal again for said she my dears it will teach you to be thankful and you may take my word for it it is always the ungrateful people who are the most miserable ones oh aunt judy here interposed number six somewhat vehemently you need not tell any more i know you mean us by the little victims but you don't think we really mean to be ungrateful about the beds or the dinners or anything do you there was a melancholy earnestness in the tone of the inquiry which rather grieved aunt judy 
for she knew it was not well to magnify childish faults into too great importance so she took number six on her knee and assured her she never imagined such a thing as their being really ungrateful for a moment if she had she added she should not have turned their little ways into fun as she had done in the story number six was comforted somewhat on hearing this but still leaned her head on aunt judy's shoulder in a rather pensive state i wonder what makes one so tiresome mused the meditative number five trying to view the matter quite abstractly as if he himself was in no way concerned in it thoughtlessness only replied aunt judy smiling i have often heard mamma say it is not ingratitude in children when they don't think about the comforts they enjoy every day because the comforts seem to them to come like air and sunshine as a mere matter of course really exclaimed number six in a quite hopeful tone does mamma really say that yes but then you know continued aunt judy everybody has to be taught to think by degrees and then they get to know that no comforts ever do really come to anybody as a matter of course no not even air and sunshine but every one of them as blessings permitted by god and which therefore we have to be thankful for so you see we have to learn to be thankful as we have to learn everything else and mamma says it is a lesson that never ends even for grown-up people and now you understand number six that you oh i beg pardon i mean the little victims were not really ungrateful but only thoughtless and the wonderful stranger lady did something to cure them of that and in fact proved a sort of aunt judy to them for she explained things in such a very entertaining manner that they actually began to think the matter over and then they left off being stupid and unthankful but this reminds me added aunt judy that you tiresome number six have spoilt my story after all i had not half got to the end of the miseries for instance there was the taking care misery in consequence of which the little victims were sent out to play on a fine day and kept in when it was stormy and wet all because the stupid keepers were more anxious to keep them well in health than to please them at the moment and then there was above all here aunt judy became very impressive the washing misery which consisted in their being obliged to make themselves clean and comfortable with soap and water whenever they happened to be dirty whether with playing at knuckle-bones on the floor or anything else and which was considered so hard that but here a small hand was laid on aunt judy's mouth and a gentle voice said stop aunt judy now on which the rest shouted stop stop we won't hear any more in chorus until all at once in the midst of the din there sounded outside the door the ominous knocking which announced the hour of repose to the juvenile branches of the family it was a well-known summons but on this occasion produced rather an unusual effect first there was a sudden profound silence and pause of several seconds then an interchange of glances among the little ones then a breaking out of involuntary smiles upon several young faces and at last a universal good night aunt judy very quietly and demurely spoken if the little victims were only here to see how you behave over the going to bed misery what a lesson it would be suggested aunt judy with a mischievous smile ah yes yes we know we know was the only reply and it came from number eight who took advantage of being the youngest to be more saucy than the rest aunt judy now led the little party into the drawing-room to bid their father and mother good night too and certainly when the door was opened and they saw how bright and cosy everything looked in the light of the fire and the lamps with mamma at the table wide awake and smiling they underwent a fearful twinge of the going to bed misery but they checked all expression of their feelings of course mamma asked what aunt judy's story had been about and heard and heard too number six's little trouble lest she should have been guilty of the sin of real ingratitude and of course mamma applauded aunt judy's explanation about the want of thought very much indeed but mamma said number six to her mother aunt judy said something about grown-up people having to learn to be thankful surely you and papa never cry for nonsense and things you can't have ah my darling number six cried mamma earnestly grown-up people may not cry for what they want exactly but they are just as apt to wish for what they cannot have as you little ones are 
For instance, grown-up people would constantly like to have life made easier and more agreeable to them than God chooses it to be. They would like to have a little more wealth, perhaps, or a little more health, or a little more rest, or that their children should always be good and clever and well and happy. And while they are thinking and fretting about the things they want, they forget to be thankful for those they have. I am often tempted in this way myself, dear number six. So you see, Aunt Judy is right, and the lesson of learning to be thankful never ends, even for grown-up people. One other word before you go. I dare say you little ones think we grown-up people are quite independent and can do just as we like. But it is not so. We have to learn to submit to the will of the great keeper of heaven and earth without understanding it, just as Aunt Judy's little victims had to submit to their keepers without knowing why. So thank Aunt Judy for her story, and let us all do our best to be obedient and contented. When I am old enough, mother, remarked number seven, in his peculiarly mild and deliberate way of speaking and smiling all the time, I think I shall put Aunt Judy into a story. Don't you think she would make a capital ogre's wife, like the one in Jack and the Beanstalk, who told Jack how to behave and gave him good advice? It was a difficult question to say no to, so Mama kissed Number Seven instead of answering him, and Number Seven smiled himself away with his head full of the bright idea. End of the Little Victims. Chapter Two of Aunt Judy's Tales by Mrs. Alfred Gaddy. Vegetables Out of Place. But any man that walks the mead in butter, blade, or bloom may find, according as his humors lead, a meaning suited to his mind. Tennyson. It was a fine May morning, not one of those with an east wind and a bright sun, which keep people in a puzzle all his day to whether it is hot or cold, and cause endless nursery disputes about the keeping on of comforters and warm coats, whenever a hoop race or some such active exertion has brought a universal pugginess over the juvenile frame. But it was a really mild, sweet-scented day, when it is quite a treat to be out of doors, whether in the gardens, the lanes, or the fields, and when nothing but a holland jacket is thought necessary by even the most tiresomely careful of mammas. It was not a day which anybody would have chosen to be poorly upon, but people have no choice in such matters, and poor little number seven of our old friends, the little ones, was in bed ill of the measles. The wise old bishop, Jeremy Taylor, told us long ago how well children generally bear sickness. They bear it, he says, by a direct sufferance. That is to say, they submit to just what discomfort exists at the moment, without fidgeting about either a cause or a consequence, and decidedly without fretting about what is to come. For a grown-up person to attain to the same state of unanxious resignation is one of the high triumphs of Christian faith. It is that delivering oneself up, of which the poor speak so forcibly on their sick beds. Number seven proved a charming instance of the truth of Jeremy Taylor's remark. He behaved in the most composed manner over his feelings, and even over his physic. During the first day or two when he sat shivering by the fire, reading Neil Darcy's Life at Sea, and was asked how he felt, he answered with his usual smile, Oh, all right, oh, a little cold now and then and afterwards, when he was in bed in a darkened room, and the same question was put, he replied almost as quietly, though without a smile, Oh, only a little too hot. Then over the medicine, he contested nothing. He made, indeed, one or two by no means injudicious suggestions as to the best method of having the disagreeable material, whether powdery or oleaginous, I will not particularize further, conveyed down his throat, commonly said, Thank you even before he had swallowed it, and then shut his eyes, and kept himself quiet. Fortunately, number one and schoolboy number three had had the complaint as well as Papa and Mama, so there were plenty to share in the nursing and house matters. The only question was, what was to be done with the little ones while Nurse was so busy, and Aunt Judy volunteered her services in their behalf. And now it will easily be supposed, after what I have said, that the nursing was not at all a difficult undertaking, but I am grieved to say that Aunt Judy's task was by no means so easy a one. The little ones were very sorry, it is true, that number seven was poorly, but unluckily they forgot it every time they went either upstairs or down. They could not bear in their minds the fact that when they encouraged the poodle to bark after an india-rubber ball, 
he was pretty sure to wake number seven out of a nap. And in short, the day being so fine and the little ones so noisy, Aunt Judy packed them all off into the garden to tidy them up. She herself taking her station in a small study, the window of which looked out upon the family playground. Her idea, perhaps, was that she could in this way combine the prosecution of her own studies with an acting policeman over the young gardeners, and keeping the peace, as she called it. But if so, she was doomed to disappointment. The operation of tidying up gardens as performed by a set of little ones scarcely needs description. It consists of a number of alterations being thought of and set about, not one of which is ever known to be finished by those who begin them. It consists of everybody wanting the rake at the same moment, and of nobody being willing to use the other tools, which they call stupid and useless things. It consists of a great many plants being moved from one place to another, when they are in full flower and dying in consequence. But how, except when they are in flower, can anyone judge where they will look best? It consists of a great many seeds being prevented from coming up at all, by an alteration, cutting into the heart of the patch just as they were bursting their shells for a sprout. It consists of an unlimited and fatal application of the cold water cure. And, finally, it results in such a confusion between footwalks and beds, such a mixture of earth and gravel, and thrown down tools, that anyone unused to the symptoms of the case might imagine that the door of the pigsty in the yard had been left open, and that its inhabitant had been performing sundry uncouth gambles with his nose in the little one's gardens. Aunt Judy was quite aware of these facts, and she had accordingly laid down several rules and given several instructions to prevent the usual catastrophe, and all went very smoothly at first in consequence. The little ones went out all hilarity and delight, and divided the tools with considerable show of justice, while Aunt Judy nodded to them approvingly out of her window, and then settled down to an interesting sum in that most peculiar of all arithmetical rules, the rule of false, the principle of which is that out of two errors made by yourself from two wrong guesses, you arrive at a discovery of the truth. When Aunt Judy first caught sight of this rule a few days before, at the end of an old summing book, it struck her fancy at once. The principle of it was capable of a much more general application than to the rule of false, and she amused herself by studying it up. It is, no doubt, a clumsy substitute for algebra, but young folks who have not learnt algebra will find it a very entertaining method of making out all such sums as the following old puzzler, over which Aunt Judy was now poring. There is a certain fish, whose head is nine inches in length, his tail as long as his head and half of his back, and his back as long as both head and tail together. Query. The length of the fish. But Aunt Judy was not left long in peace with her fish. While she was in the thick of suppositions and errors, a tap came at the window. Aunt Judy! Stop! was the answer. And the hand of the speaker went up, with the slate pencil in it, enforcing silence while she pursued her calculations. Say, back forty-two inches, then tail, half back, twenty-one, and head given, nine, that's thirty, and thirty and nine, thirty-nine back, won't do. Second error, three inches, what's the matter, number six? You surely have not begun to quarrel again. Oh, no, answered number six, with her nose flattened against the window pane. But please, Aunt Judy, number eight won't have the oyster shell trimming round his garden any longer. He says it looks so rubbishy. But as my garden joins his down the middle, if he takes away the oyster shell all round his, then what of my sides, the one in the middle, I mean, will be left bare? Don't you see? And I want to keep the oyster shells all round my garden, because Mama says there are still some zoophytes upon them. So how is it to be? What a perplexity! The fish with his nine-inch head and his tail as long as his head and half of his back was a mere nothing to it. Aunt Judy threw open the window. My dear number six, answered she, yours is the great boundary line question about which nations never do agree, but go squabbling on till someone has to give way first. There is but one plan for settling it, and that is for each of you to give up a piece of your gardens to make a road to run between. Now, if you'll both give way at once and consent to this, I will come out to you myself, and leave my fish till the evening. It's much too fine to stay indoors, I feel, and I can give you all something real to do. I'll give way, I'm sure, Aunt Judy, cried number six, quite glad to be rid of the dispute. And so will you, won't you, number eight? She added, appealing to that young gentleman who stood with his pinafore full of dirty oyster shells, 
not quite understanding the meaning of what was said. "'I'll what?' inquired he. "'Oh, never mind. Only throw the oyster-shells down, and come with Aunt Judy. It will be much better fun than staying here.' Number eight lowered his pinafore at the word of command, and dropped the discarded oyster shells one by one. Where do you think? Why? Right in the middle of his little garden, an operation which seemed to be particularly agreeable to him, if one might judge by his face. He was not sorry either to be relieved from the weight. You see, Aunt Judy continued number six to her sister, who had now joined them. It doesn't so much matter about the oyster shell trimming, but number eight's garden is always in such a mess, that I must have a wall or something between us. "'You shall have a wall or a path, decidedly,' replied Aunt Judy. "'A road is the next best thing to a river for a boundary line. "'But now all of you, pick up the tools and come with me, "'and you shall do some regular work and be paid for it "'at the rate of half a farthing for every half hour. "'Think what a magnificent offer!' "'The little ones thought so in reality and welcomed the arrangement with delight, "'and trudged off behind Aunt Judy, "'calculating so hard among themselves what the conjoint half-farthings would come to.' for the half-hours they all intended to work and furthermore what amount or variety of goodies they would purchase that aunt judy half fancied herself back in the depths of the rule of false again she led them at last to a pretty shrubbery walk of which they were all very fond on one side it was a quick-set hedge in which the honeysuckle was mixed so profusely with the thorn that they grew and were clipped together it was the choicest spot for a quiet evening stroll in summer that could possibly be imagined the sweet scent from the honeysuckle flowers stole around you with a welcome as you moved along and set you in a dreaming of some far-off region where the delicious sensations produced by the odour of the flowers may not be as transient as they are here there is an alcove in the middle of the walk not one of the modern mockeries of rusticity but a real old-fashioned lath and plaster concern such as used to be erected in front of a bowling green it was roofed in was only open on the sunny side, and was supported by a couple of little ionic pillars, up which clematis and passion flower were studiously trained. There was a table as well as seats within, and the alcove was a very nice place for either reading or drawing in, as it commanded a pretty view of the distant country. It was also, and perhaps especially, suited to the young people in their more poetical and fanciful moods. The little ones had no sooner reached the entrance of the favorite walk then they scampered past Aunt Judy to run a race. But number six stopped suddenly short. Aunt Judy, look at those horrible weeds. Ah, I do believe this is what you brought us here for. It was indeed, for some showers the evening before had caused them to flourish in a painfully prominent manner, and the favorite walk presented a somewhat neglected appearance. So Aunt Judy marked it off for the little ones to weed, repeated the exhilarating promise of the half-farthings, and seated herself in the alcove to puzzle out the length of the fish. At first it was rather amusing to hear how even in the midst of their weeding, the little ones pursued their calculations of the anticipated half-farthings, and discussed the niceness and prices of the various descriptions of goodies. But by degrees less and less was said, and at last the half-farthings and goodies seemed altogether forgotten, and a new idea to arise in their place. The new idea was that this weeding task was uncommonly troublesome. I'm sure there are many more weeds in my piece than in anybody else's, remarked the tallest of the children, standing up to rest his rather tired back and contemplate the walk. I don't think Aunt Judy measured it out fair. Well, but you're the biggest and ought to do the most, responded number six. A little of the most is all very well, persisted number five, but I've got too much the most, rather, and it's very tiresome work. "'What nonsense!' rejoined number six. "'I don't believe the weeds are any thicker in your piece than in mine. "'Look at my big heap, and I'm sure I'm quite as tired as you are.' Number six got up as she spoke, to see how matters were going on, not at all sorry either to change her position. "'I've got the most,' muttered number eight to himself, still kneeling over his work. "'But this was, it is to be feared, a very unjustifiable bit of brag.' "'If you go on talking so much, you will not get any half-farthings at all,' shouted number four from the distance. A pause followed this morning, and the small party ducked down again to the work. A pause followed this morning, and the small party ducked down again to their work. They no longer liked it, however, and very soon afterwards the jocose number five observed in subdued tones to the others. "'I wonder what the little victims would have said to this kind of thing.' 
They'd have hated it, answered number six very decidedly. The fact was, the little ones were getting really tired, for the fine May morning had turned into a hot day, and in a few minutes more, a still further aggravation of feeling took place. Number six got up again, shook the gravel from her frock, blew it off her hands, pushed back a heap of heavy curls from her face, set her hat as far back on her head as she could, and exclaimed, I wish there were no such thing as weeds in the world. Everybody seemed struck with this impressive sentiment, for they all left off weeding at once, and Aunt Judy came forward to the front of the alcove. Don't you, Aunt Judy? added number six, feeling sure her sister had heard. Not I, indeed, answered Aunt Judy with a comical smile. I'm too fond of cream to my tea. Cream to your tea, Aunt Judy? What can that have to do with it? The little ones were amazed. Something. At any rate, responded Aunt Judy, and if you like to come in here and sit down, I will tell you how. Away went hose and weeding knives at once, and into the alcove they rushed, and never had garden seats felt so thoroughly comfortable before. If one begins to wish, suggested number five, stretching his legs out to their full extent, one may as well wish oneself a grand person with a lot of gardeners to clear away the weeds as fast as they come up, and save one the trouble. Much better wish them away, and save everybody the trouble, persisted number six. No, one wants them sometimes. What an idea! Whoever wants weeds? You yourself. I? What nonsense! But the persevering number five proceeded to explain. Number six had asked him a few days before to bring her some groundsel for a canary, and he had been quite disappointed at finding none in the garden. He had actually to trail into the lanes to fetch a bit. This was a puzzling statement, so number six contented herself with grumbling out, Weeds are welcome to grow in the lanes. Weeds are not always in the lanes, persisted number five with a grin. They're sometimes wild flowers. I don't care what they are, pouted number six. I wish I lived in a place where there were none. And I wish I was a great man with lots of gardeners to take them up instead of me, maintained number five, who was in a mood of lazy tiresomeness, and kept rocking to and fro on the garden chair, with his hands tucked under his thighs. A weed, a weed, continued he. What is a weed, I wonder? Aunt Judy, what is a weed? Aunt Judy had surely been either dreaming or cogitating during the last few minutes, for she had taken no notice of what was said, but she roused up now and answered, a vegetable, out of its place. A vegetable, repeated number five. Why, we don't eat them, Aunt Judy. You kitchen garden interpreter, who said we did? Replied she. All green herbs are vegetables, let me tell you, whether we eat them or not. Oh, I see, mused number five, quietly enough, but in another instant he broke out again. I'll tell you what, though. Some of them are real vegetables. I mean kitchen garden vegetables to other creatures, and that's why they're wanted. Groundsel's a vegetable. It's the canary's vegetable. I mean his kitchen garden vegetable, and if he had a kitchen garden of his own, he would grow it as we do peas. So I was right after all, number six. That twit at the end spoilt everything, otherwise this was really a bright idea of number five's. Aunt Judy, do begin to talk yourself, entreated number six. I wish number five would be quiet and not tease. And he wishes the same of you, replied Aunt Judy, and I wish the same of you all. What is to be done? Come. I will tell you a story on one positive understanding, namely, that whoever teases, or even twits, shall be turned out of company. Number five sat up in his chair like a dart in an instant, and vowed that he would be the best of the good, till Aunt Judy had finished her story. After which I shall expect you to be better still, was Aunt Judy's emphatic rejoinder. And peace being now completely established, she commenced. There was once upon a time, what do you think? Here she paused and looked round in the children's faces. A giant, exclaimed number eight. A beautiful princess, suggested number six. Something, said Aunt Judy. But I am not going to tell you what at present. You must find out for yourselves. Meantime, I shall call it something, or merely make a grunting, hm, when I allude to it, as people do to express a blank. The little ones shuffled about in delighted impatience at the notion of the mysterious something which they were to find out, and Aunt Judy proceeded. This, hm, then, lived in a large meadow field, where it was the delight of all beholders. The owner of the property was constantly boasting about it to his friends, for he maintained that it was the richest and most beautiful and most valuable, hm, in all the country road. Surely no other thing in this world ever found itself more admired or prized than this something did. 
the commonest passer-by would notice it and say all manner of fine things in its praise whether in the early spring the full summer or the autumn for at each of these seasons it put on a fresh charm and formed a subject of conversation only look at that lovely hm was quite a common exclamation at the sight of it what a colour it has how fresh and healthy it looks how invaluable it must be why it must be worth at least and then the speaker would go calculating away at the number of pounds shillings and pence the hm would fetch if put into the money market which is i am sorry to say a very usual although very degrading way of estimating worth to conclude the mild-eyed alderney cow who pastured in the field during the autumn months would chew the cud of approbation over the hm for hours together and people said it was no wonder at all she gave such delicious milk and cream here a shout of supposed discovery broke from number five i've guessed i know it but a hush from aunt judy stopped him short number five nobody asked your opinion keep it to yourself if you please number five was silenced but rubbed his hands nevertheless well continued aunt judy that something ought surely to have been the most contented thing in the world its merits were acknowledged its usefulness was undoubted its beauty was the theme of constant admiration what had it left to wish for really nothing but by an unlucky accident it became dissatisfied with its situation in a meadow field and wished to get into a higher position in life which it took for granted would be more suited to its many exalted qualities the something of the field wanted to inhabit a garden the unlucky accident that gave rise to this foolish idea was as follows a little boy was running across the beautiful meadow one morning with a tin pot full of fishing bait in his hand when suddenly he stumbled and fell down the bait in the tin pot was some lobworms which the little boy had collected out of the garden adjoining the field and they were spilt and scattered about by his fall he picked up as many as he could find however and ran off again but one escaped his notice and was left behind this gentleman was insensible for a few seconds but as soon as he came to himself and discovered that he was in a strange place he began to grumble and find fault what an uncouth neighbourhood such were his exclamations what rough and practical roads was ever lobworm so unlucky before it was impossible to move an inch without bumping his sides against some piece of uncultivated ground judge for yourselves my dears continued aunt judy pathetically what must have been the feelings of the something which had lived proudly and happily in the meadow field for so long on hearing such offensive remarks its spirit was up in a minute just as yours would have been and it did not hesitate to inform the intruder that travellers who find fault with the country before they have taken the trouble to inquire into its merits are very ignorant and impertinent people this was blow for blow as you perceive and the tease and twit system was now continued with great animation on both sides the lobworm inquired with this conceited wriggle what could be the merits of a country where gentlemanly gliding thin-skinned creatures like himself were unable to move about without personal annoyance whereupon the amiable something made no scruple of telling the lobworm that his betters found no fault with the place and instanced its friend and admirer of the alderney cow on which the lobworm affected forgetfulness and exclaimed cow cow do i know of this creature ah yes i recollect now clumsy legs horny feet and that sort of thing proceeding to hint that what was good enough for a cow might yet not be refined enough for his own more delicate habits it is my misfortune perhaps concluded he with mock humility to have been accustomed to higher associations but really situated as i am here i could almost feel disposed to why positively to wish myself a cow with clumsy legs and horny feet what one may live to come to to be sure well aunt judy proceeded will you believe it the lobworm went on boasting till the poor deluded something believed every word he had said and at last ventured to ask in what favoured spot he had acquired his superior taste and knowledge and then of course the lobworm had the opportunity of opening out in a very magnificent bit of brag and did not fail to do so travellers can always boast with impunity to stationary folk and the lobworm had no conscience about speaking the truth so on he chattered giving the most splendid account of the garden in which he lived gorgeous flowers velvet lawns polished gravel walks along which he was wont to take his early morning stroll before the ruder creatures of the neighbourhood such as dogs cats and company were up and about were all his discourse 
and he spoke of them as if they were his own and told of the nursing and tending of every plant in the lovely spot as if the gardeners did it all for his convenience and pleasure of the little accidents to which he and his race have from time immemorial been liable from awkward spades or those very early birds by whom he ran a risk of being snapped up every time he emerged out of the velvet lawns for the morning strolls he said just nothing at all all was unmixed delight according to his account in the garden and having actually boasted himself into good humour with himself and therefore with everybody else he concluded by expressing the condescending wish that the something in the field should get itself removed to the garden to enjoy the life of which he spoke undeniably beautiful as you are here cried he your beauty will increase a thousandfold under the gardener's fostering care appreciated as you are now in your rustic life the most prominent place will be assigned to you when you get into more distinguished society so that everybody who passes by and sees you will exclaim in delight behold this exquisite hm oh dear aunt judy cried number six was the hum as you will call it so silly as to believe what he said how could the poor simple-minded thing be expected to resist such elegant compliments my dear number six answered aunt judy but then came the difficulty the something which lived in the field had no more legs than the lobworm to himself and in fact was incapable of locomotion of course it was ejaculated number five order cried aunt judy and proceeded so the hm hung down its graceful head in despair but suddenly a bright and loving thought struck it it could not change its place and rise in life itself but its children might and that would be some consolation it opened its heart on this point to the lobworm and although the lobworm had no heart to be touched he had still a tongue to talk if the hm would send its children to the garden at the first opportunity he would be delighted absolutely charmed to introduce them in the world he would put them in the way of everything and see that they were properly attended to there was nothing he couldn't or wouldn't do this last pretentious brag seemed to have exhausted even the lobworm's ingenuity for soon after he had uttered it he shuffled away out of the meadow in the best fashion that he could leaving the something in the field in a state of wondering regret but it recovered its spirits again when the time came for sending its children to the favoured garden abode my dears it said you will soon have to begin life for yourselves and i hope you will do so with credit to your bringing up i hope you are now ambitious enough to despise the dull old plan of dropping contentedly down just where you happen to be or waiting for some chance traveller who may never come to give you a lift elsewhere that paradise of happiness of which the lobworm told us is close at hand come it only wants a little extra exertion on your part and you will be carried thither by the wind as easily as the wandering dandelion himself courage my dears nothing out of the common is ever gained without an effort see now as soon as ever a strong breeze blows the proper way i shall shake my heads as hard as ever i can that you may be off all the doors and windows are open now you know and you must throw yourselves out upon the wind only remember one thing when you are settled down in the beautiful garden mind you hold up your heads and do yourselves justice my dears the children gave a ready assent of course as proud as possible at the notion and when the favourable breeze came and the maternal heads were shaken out they all flew and trusted themselves to its guidance and in a few minutes settled down all over the beautiful garden some on the beds some on the lawn some on the polished gravel walks and all i can say is happiest to those who were least seen grass-weeds grass-weeds shouted the incorrigible number five jumping up from his seat and performing two or three dervish-like turns oh it's too bad isn't it aunt judy cried number six to stop your story in the middle whereupon aunt judy answered that he had not stopped the story in the middle but at the end and she was glad he had found out the meaning of her hm but number six would not be satisfied she liked to hear the complete finish up of everything did the hums children ever grow up in the garden or did they ever see the lobworm again the hums children did spring up in the garden answered aunt judy and did their best to exhibit their beauty on the polished gravel walks where they were particularly delighted with their own appearance one may morning after a shower of rain which had made them more prominent than usual remember our mother's advice cried they to each other this is the happy moment let us hold up our heads and do ourselves justice my dears 
scarcely were the words spoken when a troop of rude creatures came scampering into the walk and a particularly unfeeling monster in curls pointed to the beautiful upstanding little hums and shouted aunt judy look at these horrible weeds i needn't say more concluded aunt judy you know how you've used them you know what you've done to them you know how you've even wished there were no such things in the world oh aunt judy how capital ejaculated number six with a sigh the sigh of exhausted amusement the hum was a weed too then wasn't it said number eight he did not quite see his way through the tale it was not a weed in the meadow answered aunt judy where it was useful and fed the alderney cow it was beautiful grass there and was counted as such because that was its proper place but when it put its nose into garden walks where it was not wanted and had no business then everybody called the beautiful grass a weed so a weed is a vegetable out of its place you see subjoined number five who felt the idea to be half his own and it won't do to wish there were none in the world and a vegetable out of its place being nothing better than a weed mr number five added aunt judy it won't do to be too anxious about what is so often falsely called bettering your condition in life come the story is done and now we'll go home and all the patient listeners and weeders may reckon upon getting one or more farthings apiece from mamma and as number six's wish is not realized and there are still weeds in the world and among them grass weeds i shall hope to have some cream to my tea end of vegetables out of place section three cook stories down too down at your own fireside with the evil tongue and the evil ear for each is at war with mankind tennyson's maud aunt judy had gone to the nursery wardrobe to look over some clothes and the little ones were having a play to themselves as she opened the door they were just coming out to the end of an explosive burst of laughter in which all the five appeared to have joined and which they had some difficulty in stopping number four who was a biggish girl had giggled till the tears were running over her cheeks and number eight in sympathy was leaning back in his tiny chair in a sort of ecstasy of amusement the five little ones had certainly hit upon some very entertaining game they were all boys and girls alike dressed up as elderly ladies with bits of rubbishy finery on their heads and round their shoulders to imitate caps and scarfs the boys hair being neatly parted and brushed down the middle and they were seated in form round what was called the doll's table a concern just large enough to allow of a small crockery tea surface with cups and saucers and little plates being set out upon it what have you got there was all aunt judy asked as she went up to the table to look at them cowslip's tea was number four's answer laying out her hand on the fat pink teapot and thereupon the laughing explosion went off nearly as loudly as before though for no accountable reason that aunt judy could divine it's so good aunt judy do taste it exclaimed number eight jumping up in a great fuss and holding up his little cup full of a pale buff fluid to aunt judy you'll have everything over cried number four calling him to order and in truth the table was not the steadiest in the world so number eight sat down again calling out in an almost stuttering hurry you may keep it all aunt judy i don't want any more but neither did aunt judy after she had given it one taste so she put the cup down thanking number eight very much but pulling such a funny face that it set the laugh going once more in the middle of which number four dropped an additional lump of sugar into the rejected buff coloured mixture a proceeding which evidently gave number eight a new relish for the beverage aunt judy had got beyond the age when cowslip tea was looked upon as one of the treats of life and she had not on the other hand lived long enough to love the taste of it for the memory's sake of the enjoyment it once afforded not but what we are obliged to admit that cowslip tea is one of those things which 
even in the most enthusiastic days of youth, just falls short of the absolute perfection one expects from it. Even under those most favourable circumstances of having had the delightful gathering of the flowers in the sweet sunny fields, the picking of them in the happy holiday afternoon, the permission to use the best doll's tea service for the feast, the loan of a nice white tablecloth, and the present of half a dozen pure knives and forks to fancy cut the biscuits with. Nay, even in spite of the addition of well-fitted doll's sugar pot and cream jugs, cowslip tea always seems to want either a little more or a little less sugar, or a little more or a little less cream, or to be a little more or a little less strong, to turn it into that complete nectar, which of course it really is. On the present occasion, however, the children had clearly got hold of some other source of enjoyment over the annual cowslip tea feast, besides the beverage itself, and Aunt Judy, glad to see them so safely happy, went off to her business at the wardrobe while the little ones resumed their game. "'Very extraordinary indeed, ma'am,' began one of the fancy old ladies in a completely fancy voice, a little affected or so. "'Most extraordinary, ma'am, I may say.' Here there was a renewed giggle from number four, which she carefully smothered in her handkerchief. "'But still I think I can tell you of something most extraordinary still.' The speaker having at this point refreshed his ideas by a sip of the pale-coloured tea and the other ladies having laughed heartily in anticipation of the fun that was coming, one of them observed, "'You don't say so, ma'am,' then clicked astonishment with her tongue against the roof of her mouth several times and added impressively, "'Pray let us hear.' i shall be most happy ma'am resumed the first speaker with a graceful inclination forward well you see it was a party i had invited some of my most distinguished friends really ma'am fashionable friends i may say to dinner and ahem you see some little anxiety always attends such affairs even in the best regulated families here the speaker winked considerably at number four and laughed very loudly himself at his own joke dear me you must excuse me ma'am he proceeded so you see i felt a little fatigued by my morning's exertions to tell you the truth there had been no end of bother about everything and i retired quietly upstairs to take a short nap before the dressing bell rang but i had not then laid down quite half an hour when there was a loud knock on my door really ma'am i was quite alarmed but was just able to ask who's there before i had time to get an answer however the door was burst open by the housemaid her face was absolute scarlet and she sobbed out oh ma'am what shall we do good gracious anna cried i what can be the matter has the suit come down the chimney? Speak. Tis nothing of that sort, ma'am, answered Hannah. It's the cook. The cook, I shouted. I wish you would not be so foolish, Hannah, but speak out at once. What about cook? Please, ma'am, the cook's lost, says Hannah. We can't find her. Your wits are lost, Hannah, I think, cried I, and sent her to tidy the rooms while I slipped downstairs to look for the cook. Fancy a lost cook, ma'am. Was there ever such a ridiculous idea? And on the day of the dinner party, too? Did you ever hear of such a trial to a lady's feelings before? Never, I am sure, responded the lady opposite. Did you, ma'am? Turning to her neighbour. But the other three ladies all shook their heads, bit their lips, and declared, that they never had they were sure i thought not ejaculated the narrator well ma'am i went into the kitchen the larder the pantries the cellar and all sorts of places and still no cook do you know 
she really was nowhere actually ma'am the cook was lost shouts of laughter burst forth here but the lady who was number five put up his hand and called out in his own natural tones stop i haven't got to the end yet order proclaimed number four immediately in a very commanding voice and thumping the table with the head of an old wooden doll to enforce obedience and then the sham lady proceeded in some wincing voice as before well dear me i am not put out but however you see what was to be done that was the thing i wanted only half an hour to dinner time and there was the meat roasting away by itself and the potato pan boiling over you never heard such a fizzling as it made in your life in short everything was in a mess and there was no cook well i basted the meat for a few minutes took the potato pan off the fire and then ran upstairs to put on my bonnet thought i the best thing i can do is to send somebody for the policeman and let him find the cook but while i was tying the strings of my bonnet i fancied i heard a mysterious noise coming out of the bottom drawer of my wardrobe fancy that ma'am with my nerves in such a state from the cook being lost number five paused and looked around for sympathy which was the most freely given by the other ladies in the shape of sighs and exclamations the drawer was a very deep drawer ma'am so i thought perhaps the cat had crept in continued number five well i went to it to see and there it was partly open with a cotton gown in it that didn't belong to me imagine my feelings at that ma'am so i pulled out the handles to get the drawer quite open but it wouldn't come it was as heavy as lead it was really very alarming one doesn't like such odd things happening but at last i got it open though i tumbled backwards as i did so and what do you think ma'am ladies what do you think was in it the cook shrieked number four convulsed with laughter and the whole party clapped their hands and roared applause the cook ma'am actually the cook pursued number five one of the fattest most paunchy little women you ever saw and what do you think was the history of it i kept my upstairs pickwick in the corner of that bottom drawer she had seen it there that very morning when she was helping to dust the room and took the opportunity of a spare half hour to slip up and rest herself by reading it in the drawer ma'am you see and teaching people to read all the cooks in the country are spoilt peals of laughter greeted this wonderfully witty concoction of number fives and the lemon-coloured tea and biscuits were partaken of during the pause which followed aunt judy meanwhile who had been quite unable to resist joining in the laugh herself was seated on the floor behind the open door of the wardrobe thinking to herself of certain passages in wordsworth's most beautiful ode in which she has described the play of children as if their whole vocation were endless imitation truly they had got hold here of strange fragments from their dream of human life where could the children have picked up the original of such absurd nonsense aunt judy had no time to make it out for now the mincing voices began again and she sat listening have you had no curious adventures with your maids ma'am inquires number five of number four number five makes an attempt at a bewitching grin as he speaks faming himself with a fan which he has in his hand all the time he was telling his story well ladies replied number four only just able to compose herself to talk i don't think i have been quite as fortunate as yourselves in having so many extraordinary things to tell my servants have been sadly commonplace and done just as they ought but still once ladies once a curious little incident did occur to me oh ma'am i entreat you pray let us hear it burst from all the ladies at once 
Number four had to bite her lip to preserve her gravity, and then she turned to number five. The fan, if you please, ma'am. The rule was that one fan was placed at the disposal of the storyteller for the time. So number five handed it to number four with a graceful bow, and number four wafted to and fro immediately and began her account. People are so unscrupulous, you see, ladies, about giving characters. It's really shocking. For my part, I don't know what the world will come to at last. We shall all have to be our own servants, I suppose. People say anything about anything. That's the fact. Only fancy, ma'am. Three different ladies once recommended a cook to me at the best soup maker in the country. Now that sounded a very high recommendation. For, of course, if a cook can make soups, she can do anything. Sweet meats and those kind of things follow of themselves. So, ma'am, I took her and had a dinner party and ordered two soups, entirely that I might show off what a good cook I had got. Think what a compliment to her and how much obliged she ought to have been. Well, ma'am, I ordered the two soups, as I said, one white and the other brown, and everything appeared to be going on in the best possible manner when, as I was sitting in the drawing room, entertaining the company, I was told I was wanted. When I got out of the room, there was the man I had hired to wait, and says he, If you please, ma'am, where are the knives? I can't find any at all. The knives, says I. Dear me, don't come to me about the knives. Ask the cook, of course. Please, ma'am, I have asked her, and she only laughed. Then, said I, ask the housemaid. It's impossible for me to come out and look for the knives. Well, ladies, continued number four, would you believe it? Could anyone believe it? When I sat down to dinner and began to help the soup, no sooner had the silver ladle, my ladle is silver ladies, been plunged into the taurine, than a most singular rattling was heard. William, cried I, half in a whisper, to the waiter who was holding the plate, what in the world is this? Surely, cook has not left the bones in? Please, ma'am, I don't know, was all the man could say. Well, there was no remedy now, so I dipped the ladle in again and lifted out. Oh, ma'am, I know if it was anybody but myself who told you, you wouldn't believe it. A ladle full of lost knives. There they were, my best beautiful ivory handles, all in the white soup. And while I'm discovering them, the gentleman at the other end of the table had found all the kitchen knives with black handles in the brown soup. Then never was anything so mortifying before. And what do you think was Cook's excuse when I approached her? Please, ma'am, said she, I read in the young women's Vodemicum of instructive information, page 150, that there was nothing in the world so strengthening and wholesome as dissolved bones and ivory dust. So, ma'am, I always make a point of throwing in a few knives into every soup I have the charge of for the sake of the handles. Ivory handles for white soups, ma'am, and black handles for the browns. Thunders of applause interrupted Cook's excuse at this point, and number seven was so overcome that he pushed his chair back and performed three distinct somersets on the floor to the complete disorganization of his headdress, which consisted of a turban from beneath which hung a cluster of false curls. Turban and wig being replaced, however, and number seven reseated and composed, number four proceeded. Cook generally takes them out, she informed me, ladies, before the tureens come to table. But, said she, my back was turned for a minute here, ma'am, and that stupid William carried them off without asking if they were ready. It's all William's fault, ma'am. Don't want to stay, for I don't like a place where the man who waits has no tact. Now, ladies, exclaimed number four, what do you think of that by way of a speech from a cook? And I assure you that a medical man's wife to whom I mentioned in the course of the evening what Cook had said about dissolved bones, told me that her husband had only laughed 
and said cook was quite right so she hired the woman that night herself and i have been told in confidence since you'll not repeat it therefore of course ladies of course not came from all sides well then i was told that before the year was out the family hadn't a knife that would cut anything they were so cankered with rust so much for education and learning to read as you justly observed ma'am before when the emotions produced by this tale had a little subsided number seven was called upon for his experience of maids number seven with the turban on his head and a fine red necklace round his throat said he took very little notice of the maids but that he once had had a very tiresome little boy in buttons who was extremely fond of sugar and always carried the sugar shaker in his pocket and ate up the sugar that was in it and when it was empty filled it up with magnesia but once he added ladies he actually put some soda in it it was a party and we had our first rhubarb tart for the season and the company sprinkled it all over with the soda and began to eat but they were too polite to say how nasty it was but of course when i was helped i called out and what do you think the boy in buttons said nobody could guess so number seven had to tell them he said he had put it in on purpose because he thought it would correct the acid of the pie so i said he had best be apprenticed to a doctor so he went i dare say ma'am it was the same doctor who took your cook but i never heard of him any more and i've never dared to have a boy in buttons again a very wise decision ma'am i'm sure cried aunt judy who came up to the wonderful tea-table in the midst of the last bound of applause and now may i ask what game this is that you are playing at oh we're telling cook stories aunt judy cried number six seizing her by the arm they're such capital fun i wish you had heard mine they were laughing at it when you first came in it must have been delicious to judge by the delight it gave replied aunt judy smiling and kissing number six's oddly bedizened upturned face and what i want to know is what put cook stories as you call them into your head oh don't you remember and here followed a long account from number six of how about a week before the little ones had gone somewhere to spend the day and how it had turned out a very rainy day so that they could not have games out of doors with their young friends as had been expected but were obliged to sit a great part of the time in the drawing-room putting chinese puzzles together into stupid patterns and playing at fox and goose while the ladies were talking grown-up conversation as number six worded it among themselves and of course being on their own good behaviour and very quiet they could not help hearing what was said and oh dear aunt judy continued number six now with both her arms holding aunt judy of whom she was very fond except at lesson times round the waist it was so odd number seven and i did nothing at last but listen and watch them for little miss who sat with us was shy and wouldn't talk and it was so very funny to see the ladies nodding and making faces at each other and whispering and exclaiming how shocking how abominable you don't say so and all that kind of thing well but what was shocking and abominable and all that kind of thing inquired aunt judy oh i don't know things the nurses the cooks the boys in buttons did almost all the ladies had some story to tell all the servants had done something or other queer but especially the cooks aunt judy there was no end to the cooks so one day after we came back and we didn't know what to play at i said do let us play at telling cook stories like the ladies act so we've dressed up and played at cook stories ever since dear aunt judy i wish you could invent a cook story yourself was the conclusion of number six's account
so then the mystery was out aunt judy's wonderings were cut short out of the real life of civilized intelligent society had come those fragments from their dream of human life which aunt judy had called absurd nonsense indeed it was but aunt judy was seized by the idea that some good might be got out of it so in the answer to number six's wish she said with a shy smile i don't think i could tell cook's stories half as well as yourself but if by the way of change you would like a lady's story instead perhaps i might be able to accomplish that a lady's story oh but that would be so dull wouldn't it inquired number six you can't make anything funny out of them surely surely they never do half such odd things as cooks and boys and buttons the ladies themselves think not of course was aunt judy's reply but what do you think aunt judy oh i don't think it matters what i think the question is what do cooks and boys and buttons think but aunt judy ladies are never tiresome and idle and impertinent like cooks and boys and buttons oh if you had but heard the real cook stories those ladies told i say let me tell you one or two i do think i can remember them if i try then don't try on any account dear number six exclaimed aunt judy i like make-believe cook stories much better than real ones so do i cried number seven they are so much more entertaining and not a bit less useful subjoined aunt judy with a sly smile well i didn't see much good in the real ones pursued number seven in a sort of muse let us tell you another make-believe one then cried number six who saw that aunt judy was moving off and wanted to detain her then it's my turn shouted number eight jumping up and stretching out his arm and hand like a young orator flushed to his work and actually before the rest of the little ones could put him down to stop him number eight contrived to tumble out the cook story idea which had probably been brewing in his head all the time of aunt judy's talk it was very brief and this was it delivered in much haste and with all the earnestness of a maiden's speech i had a button boy too and he was a what do you call it oh a rascal that was it he was a rascal and liked the currants and mint spies so he took them all out and ate them up and put in glass beads instead so when the people began to ear their teeth crunched against the beads ah bah how nasty it was number eight accompanied this remark with a corresponding grimace of disgust and then observed in conclusion perhaps he found it in a book but i don't know where after which he lowered his outstretched arm smiled and sat down the company clapped applause and number four especially must have been very fond of laughing for the glass bead anecdote set her off again as heartily as ever and the rest followed in her wake and while so doing ever noticed that aunt judy had slipped away they soon discovered it however when their mirth began to subside but before they had time to wonder much there appeared from behind the door of the wardrobe a figure which in their secret souls they knew to be aunt judy herself although it looked a great deal stouter and had a thick filled cap on its head a white linen apron over its gown and a pair of spectacles on its nose at sight of it they showed signs of clapping again but stopped short when it spoke to them as a stranger and willingly received it as such ah it is one of the sweet features of childhood that it yields itself up so readily to any little surprise or delusion that is prepared for its amusement no nasty pride no disinclination to be carried away no affected indifference interfere with young children's enjoyment of what is offered them they will even help themselves to be pleasant visions by an effort of will and perhaps now and then end by partly believing what they at first received voluntarily as an agreeable make-believe if therefore 
after the cook figure of aunt judy had seated itself by the doll's table and the little ones had looked and grinned at it for some time hazy sensations began to steal over one or two minds and this was somehow really a cook it was all in the natural course of things that nobody resisted the feeling aunt judy's altered voice and odd assumed manner contributed no doubt a good deal to the impression dear dear what pretty little darlings you all are she began looking at them one after another as sweet as sugar plums when you have your own way and are pleased eh dears but don't you think you can take old cookie in do you no no i know what ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen's young ladies and young gentlemen are pretty well dears i can tell you don't i know all about the shiny hair and smiling faces of the little pets in the parlor and how they leave parlor manners behind them sometimes when they run to the kitchen to cook and order her here and there and want half a dozen things at once and must and will have what they want and are for popping their fingers into every pie well well she proceeded the parlor's the parlor the kitchen's the kitchen and i'm only a cook but then i conduct myself as cook even when i'm in the scullery and i only wish ladies and ladies young ladies too would conduct themselves as ladies even when they come into the kitchen that's what i call being honourable and upright well dears i'll tell you how i came to know all about it you see i lived once in a family where there were no less than eight of those precious little pets and a precious time i had of it with them but to be sure now it's past and gone plenty of excuses for them poor things they were so coaxed and flattered and made so much of what could be expected from them but tiresome wilful ways without any sense if your mamma would but put you into the scullery young miss to learn to wash plates and scar the pans out she'd make a woman of you used i to think to myself when a silly child who thought itself very clever to hinder other people's work would come hanging about in the kitchen doing nothing but tease and find fault for that's what a girl can always do it was very aggravating you may be sure dears you see i can talk to you quite reasonably because you're so nicely behaved it was very aggravating of course but i used to make allowances for them says i to myself cook you've had the blessing of being brought up to hard work ever since you were a babby you've had to earn your daily bread nobody knows how that brings people to their senses till they've tried so don't you go and be cocky because ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen's young ladies and young gentlemen are not quite so sensible as you are who knows but what if you'd been born to do nothing you might have been no wiser than them it's lucky for you you're only a cook but don't you go and be cocky that's all make allowances it's the secret of life you see dears i did make allowances and after the eight little pets was safe in bed till next morning i used to feel quite composed and pitiful like towards them poor little dears but certainly when morning came and the oldest young master was home for the holidays it was trying time for me and i couldn't think of the allowances any longer either he wouldn't get up and come down till every one else had had their breakfast and so he wanted fresh water boiled and fresh tea made and another muffin toasted and more bacon fried or else he was up so outrageous early that he was scolding because there was no hot water before the fire was lit bless you he hadn't a bit of sense in his head poor boy not a bit and how should he why he went to school as soon as he was out of petticoats and was set to all that latin and greek stuff that never puts anything useful into folks heads but so much more chatter and talk so he came back as silly as he went poor thing dear me on a wet day after lesson time those boys were like so many crazy creatures cook i must make a pie says one there's a pie in the oven already master james says i 
i don't care about the pie in the oven says he i want a pie of my own bring me the flour and the water and the butter and all the things and above all the rolling pin and clear the decks will you i say for my pie here goes and here used to go my dears for master james had no sense as i told you and so he'd shove all my pots and dishes away one on the top of the other and let me be as busy as i would and dinner ever so near ready the dresser must be cleared and everything must give way to his pie his pie indeed i wish i had had the management of his pie just then i'd have taught him what it was to come shaking the rolling pin at the head of a respectable cook who wanted to get her business done properly as in duty bound but he wasn't the only one there was little whipper snapper his younger brother squeaking out in another corner i shan't make a pie james i shall make toffee it's far better fun you'd better come and help me where's the treacle pot cook cook i say cook where's the treacle pot and look at this stupid kettle and pan what's in the pan i wonder oh kidney beans who cares for kidney beans how can i make toffee when all these things are on the fire stay i'll hand them all off and sure enough if i hadn't rushed for master james who was drinking away at my custard out of the bowl to seize a whipper snapper who had got his hand on the vegetable pan already he would have pulled it and the kettle and the whole concern off the fire and perhaps scalded himself to death then of course there comes a scuffle and master whipper snapper begins to roar and out comes missus who poor thing had no more sense in her head than her sons though she'd never been to school to lose it over latin and greek and says she with all her ribbons streaming and her petticoat swelled out like a window curtain in a draught says she cook i desire that you will not touch my children as you please ma'am says i if you'll be so good as to stop the young gentleman from touching my pans and i was going to say custard but master james shouts out quite quick why i only wanted to make a pie mamma and i only wanted to make some toffee cries whipper snapper and then mamma answers like a duchess at court there can't be possibly any objection my dears and i wish cook you would be a little more good-natured to the children your temper is sadly against you and out she sails ribbons and window curtains and all and says i to myself as i cool down for the young gentlemen luckily went away with their dear mamma says i to myself it's a very fine thing no doubt to go about in ribbons and petticoats and grand clothes but if one must needs carry such a poor silly head inside them as missus does i'd rather stop as i am and be a cook with some sense about me i shan't say my dears continued the supposed cook that i spoke very politely just then but who could feel polite when their dinner had been put back at least half an hour over such nonsense as that missus used to say the dear boys came to the kitchen on a wet day because they'd got nothing else to do nothing else to do and had learnt latin and greek and all sorts of schooling besides so much for education thought i why it would spoil the best lads that were ever born into the world for of course you know if these young gentlemen had been put to decent trades they'd have found something else to do with their fingers besides mischief and waste and dear me i talk about not having been polite to missus just then but now you tell me dears what missus with all her education would have said if she'd been in my place when one young gentleman was drinking her custard and another young gentleman was pulling her pans on the floor do you think that she'd have been a bit more polite than i was wouldn't she have called me all the stupid creatures that ever were born and told the story over and over to her friends and acquaintances to make them stare and say there were surely no such simpletons in the world as ladies and gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen's young ladies and young gentlemen however i did not go as far as that 
because you see i had some sense about me and couldn't make allowances for all the nonsense the poor things are brought up to there was no resisting the twinkle in aunt judy's eye when she came to this point though it shone through an old pair of nurse's spectacles and the little ones clapped their hands and declared it was very bit as good as a cook story only a great deal better that twinkle had quite brought aunt judy back to them again in spite of her cook's attire and number six cried out oh don't stop aunt judy do go on cookie dear do tell some more there now exclaimed aunt judy throwing herself back in the chair isn't that a regular young lady's question out and out who but a young lady with no more sense in her head than a pin would have thought of asking such a thing why miss is there a joint in the world that can bear basting for ever no no a time comes when it must be taken down if any goods to be left in it and so at the end of three years my basting time was over and the time for taking down was come cook says i to myself you must give in if you go on with those cherubs that was their company name you know much longer there won't be a bit of you left and sure enough that very morning dears they'd come down upon me with a fresh grievance and i couldn't stand it i really couldn't the sweeps had been by four o'clock to the kitchen chimney and i'd been up and toiling every minute since and hadn't had time to eat my breakfast when in they burst the young ladies not the sweeps dears i mean and there they broke out at once i hadn't fed their seagulls before breakfast a couple of dull-looking grey birds with big mouths that had come in a hamper overnight as a present to the cherubs and it seems i ought to have been up before daylight almost to look for slugs for them in the garden till they'd got used to the place oh these ladies and gentlemen if they'd need know something of some sort to make amends for there are many things they never know all their life long young ladies says i i didn't come here to get meals ready for seagulls but christian ladies and gentlemen if the seagulls want a cook your mamma must hire them one on purpose i've plenty to do for her and the family without looking after such nonsense as that that's what you always say whimpers the youngest miss and you know they don't want any cooking but only raw slugs and you know you might easily look for them because you've got nothing to do because it's such an easy place mamma always says but you're always cross mamma says that too and everybody knows you are because she tells everybody when little miss had got that out she thought she'd finished me up and so she had for when i heard that missus was so ungenteel to go on talking of what i did to all her acquaintance and had nothing better to talk about i made up my mind that i'd give notice that very day very well miss says i your mamma shall soon have something fresh to talk about and i hope she'll find it a pleasant change there were some of them new that i meant at once for after they'd scampered off i heard shouts up and down the stairs from one or the to the other cook's going we shall have a new cook soon what a lark we'll have with the toffee and the pies we'll make her do just as we choose there now thought i to myself there'll be somebody else put down to baste before long well i'm glad my time's over and thereupon i fell to wishing i was back again in father and mother's rickety old cottage that i'd once been so proud to leave to go and live with gentlefolks but you see it was no use wishing for i'd my bread to earn and must turn out somewhere let it be as disagreeable as it would father and mother were dead and there was no rickety cottage for me to go back to so i wiped my eyes and told myself to make the best of what had to be well dears pursued cookie after a short pause during which the little ones looked far more inclined to cry than laugh missus was quite taken aback when she heard i wouldn't stay any longer cook she said i'm perfectly astonished at your want of sense in not recognizing the value of such a situation as mine and as to your complaints about the children anything more ridiculously unreasonable i have never heard such superior well-taught young people you are not very likely to meet with again in a hurry 
perhaps not ma'am says i in french and crochet and the piano and latin and things i don't understand being only a cook but i know what behaviour is and that's what i'm sure the young ladies and gentlemen have never been taught or if they have they are so slow at taking it in that i think i shall do better with a family where the behaviour lessons come first mrs was very angry and so was i but at last she said cook i shall not argue with you any longer you know no better and i suppose i must make allowances for you i am much obliged to you ma'am i am sure was my answer it's what i've always done by you ever since i came to the house and i'll do it still with pleasure and think no more of what's been said i spoke from my heart i can tell you dears for i felt very sorry for missus and thought she was but a lady after all and perhaps i'd hardly made allowances though i'd lost my temper too as i knew after she went away but you see while she was there it was so mortifying to be spoken to as if all the sense was on her side when i knew it was all on mine wherever the french and crochet may have been well but on the day before i left i broke down with another of them as it's fair that you should know i'd felt very lonely that day as busy as i was and in the afternoon i took myself into the scullery to give the pans a sort of good-bye cleaning and be out of everybody's way but there in the midst of it comes the eldest young gentleman flinging into the kitchen shouting cook cook where's cook as usual i thought he was after some of his old tricks and i had been fretting over those pans thinking what a sad job it was to have no home to go to in the world so i gave him a very short answer master james says i i've done with nonsense now i can't attend to you you must wait till the next cook comes but master james came straight away to the scullery door and says he cook i'm not coming to tease i've brought you a needle book there cook it's full of needles i put them all in myself keep it please dear dear i can't forget it yet pursued cook how master james stood on the little stone step of the scullery with his arm stretched out and the needle book he'd brought for me in his hand i don't know how i thanked him i'm sure but i had to go back to the sink and wash the dirt off my hands before i could touch the pretty little thing and then i told him i would keep it as long as ever i lived and laughed cooky he laughed and says he now shake hands cooky and so we shook hands and then off he ran and i went back to my pans and fairly cried why cook says i to myself that lad's got as good a heart as your own after all and as to sense and behaviour they haven't been forced on him yet as they have upon you latin's latin and conduct's conduct and one doesn't teach the other and it's too bad to expect more of people than what they've had opportunity for well dears that was the rule i always went by and i've been in many situations since with single ladies and single gentlemen and large families and all and there was something to put up with in all of them and they always told me there was a good deal to put up with in me and perhaps there was however it doesn't matter as long as missus and servant go by one rule to make allowances and not expect more from people than what they've had opportunity for and above all never to be cocky when all the advantage is on their side it's a good rule dears and will stop many a foolish word and idle tale if you'll go by it aunt judy had finished at last and she took off the old spectacles and laid them on the doll's table and paused it is a good rule observed number four and i shall go by it and not tell real cook stories when i grow up i hope i love old cooky cried number six getting up and hugging her around the neck but it's wrong aunt judy to tell funny make-believe cook stories like ours not at all number six replied aunt judy my private belief is that if you tell funny make-believe cook stories while you're little you will be ashamed of telling stupid 
real ones when you're grown up. End of Cook's Stories Chapter 4 Rabbit's Tales Death and its twofold aspect, wintry one, cold, sullen, blank from hope and joy, shut out. The other, which the ray divine hath touched, replete vivid promise, bright as spring. Wordsworth Well then, but you must remember that I have been ill and cannot be expected to invent anything very entertaining. Oh, we do remember indeed, Aunt Judy, we have been so miserable, was the answer. And the speaker added, shoving her little chair close up to her sister's, I said if you were not to get better, I shouldn't want to get better either. Hush, hush, number six, exclaimed Aunt Judy, quite startled by the expression. It was not right to say or think that. I couldn't help it, persisted number six. We couldn't do without you, I'm sure. We can do without anything which God chooses to take away, was Aunt Judy's very serious answer. But I didn't want to do without, murmured number six, with her eyes fixed on the door. Dear number six, I know, replied Aunt Judy kindly, but that is just what you must try not to feel. I can't help feeling it, reiterated number six, still looking down. You have not tried or thought about it yet, suggested her sister. But do think, think what poor ignorant infants we all are in the hands of God, not knowing what is either good or bad for us. And then, you will never see how glad and thankful you ought to be, to be chosen for by somebody wiser than yourself. We must always be contented with God's choice about whatever happens. Number six still looked down, as if she were studying the pattern of the rug, but she saw nothing of it, for her eyes were swimming over with the tears that had filled into them, and at last she said, I could perhaps about some things, but only not that about you. Aunt Judy, you know what I mean. Aunt Judy leant back in her chair. Not only that, it was, as she knew, the cry of the universal world although it broke now from the lips of a child. And it was painful, though, touching, to feel herself the treasure that could not be parted with. So there was a silence of some minutes, during which the hand of the little sister lay in that of the elder one. But the latter soon roused up and spoke. I'll tell you what. Number six, there's nothing so foolish as talking of how we shall feel or what we shall do if so and so happens. Perhaps it never may happen, or if it does, perhaps we may be helped to bear it quite differently from what we have expected. So we won't say anything more about it now. I'm so glad, exclaimed number six, completely reassured and made comfortable by the cheerful tone of her sister's remark, though she had but a very imperfect idea of the meaning of it, as she forthwith proved by rambling off into a sort of self-defence and self-justification. And I'm not really a baby now, you know, Aunt Judy. And I know a great many things that are good and bad for us. I know that you are good for us, even when you scold over sums. That is a grand admission, I must own, replied Aunt Judy, smiling. I shall remind you of it some day. Well, you may, cried number six earnestly, and asked, You see, I'm not half as silly as you thought. Aunt Judy looked at her, wondering how she should get the child to understand what was passing through her own mind, wondering, too, whether it was right to make the attempt. But she decided that on the whole it was. So she answered, I, we grow wise enough among ourselves as we grow older and get to know a few more things. You are certainly a little wiser than a baby in long petticoats, and I am a little wiser than you, and Mama wiser than us both. But towards God, we remain ignorant infants all our lives. That was what I meant. But surely, Aunt Judy, interrupted number six, Mama and you know. There she stopped. 
nothing about god's dealings pursued aunt judy but that they are sure to be good for us even when we like them least and cannot understand them at all we know how little what we ought really to like and dislike dear number six that we often fret and cry as foolishly as the two children did who while they were in mourning for their mother broke their hearts over the loss of a set of rabbit's tails number six sprang up at the idea she had never heard of those children before who were they had aunt judy read of them in a book or were they real children how could they have broken their hearts about rabbit's tails it must be a very curious story and number six begged to hear it aunt judy had however a little hesitation about the matter there was something sad about the story and there was no exact teaching to be got out of it though certainly if it helped to shake number six's faith in her own wisdom a good effect would be produced by listening to it also it was not a bad thing now and then to hear of other people having to bear trials which have not fallen to our own lot it must surely have a tendency to soften the heart and make us feel more dependent upon the god who gives and takes away on the whole therefore she would tell the story so she made number six sit quietly down again and began as follows there was once upon a time two little motherless girls number six's excitement of expectation was hardly over so she tightened her hand over aunt judy's and ejaculated poor little things you may well say so continued aunt judy it was just what everybody said who saw them at the time when they went about with their widowed father in the country village where they lived even the poor women who stood at their cottage doorsteads would look after them when they had passed and say with a sigh poor little things when they went up to london in the winter to stay with their grandmamma and walked about in the square in their little black frocks and crape trimmed bonnets the ladies who saw them even comparative strangers turn round and say poor little things if visitors came to call at the house and the children were sent for into the room there was sure to be a whispered exclamation directly among the grown-up people of poor little things but oh number six the children themselves did not think about it as all what did they know poor little things of the real misfortune that had befallen them they were sorry of course at first when they did not see their mamma as usual and when she did not come back to them as soon as they had expected but some separation had taken place during her illness and sometimes before she had been poorly and got well again and sometimes she had gone out visiting and they had had to do without her till she returned and so although the days and weeks of her absence went on to months still it was only the same thing they had felt before continued rather longer and meantime the little events of each day rose up to distract their attention they got up and dined and went to bed as usual they were sometimes merry sometimes naughty as usual people made them nice presents or sent for them to pleasant treats as usual perhaps more than usual their father did all he could to supply the place of the lost one but never could name her name and soon they forgot that they had ever had a mamma at all soon i long before friends and strangers had left off saying poor little things at sight of them and long before the black frocks and crape trimmed bonnets were laid aside which indeed they wore double the usual length of time and how old were they asked number six in a whisper four and five replied aunt judy old enough to know what they liked and disliked from hour to hour old enough to miss what had pleased them till something else pleased them as well but not old enough to look forward and know how much better a mother is wanted in life and therefore what a terrible loss the loss of a mother is it's a very sad story i'm afraid remarked number six not altogether asked aunt judy smiling 
as you shall hear one day the two little motherless girls went hand in hand across one of the courts of the great charity institution in london where their grandmamma lived in the old archway entrance and there they stood still looking round them as if waiting for something the old archway entrance opened into a square and underneath its shelter there was a bench on one side and on the other the lodge of the porter whose business it was to shut up the great gates at night the porter had often before looked at the motherless children as they passed into the shadow of his archway and said to himself poor little things for just so during many years of his life he had watched their young mother pass through and had exchanged words of friendly greeting with her and even now although it was at least a year and a half since her death when he saw the waiting children seat themselves on the bench opposite his door the old thought stole over his mind how sad that she should have been taken away so early from those little ones how sad for them to be left no one nothing in this world could supply the loss of her protecting care poor little things and not the less so because they were altogether unconscious of their misfortune and here with the morning casting a gloom over their fair young faces were looking with the utmost eagerness and delight towards the doorway now and then slipping down from their seats to take a peep into the square and see what they expected was coming now and then giggling to each other about the grave face of the old man on the other side of the way at last one who had been peeping a bit as before exclaimed with a smothered shout here he is and then the other joined her and the two rushed out together into the square and stood on the pavement stopping the way in front of a lad who held over his arm a basket containing hares and rabbit skins in which he carried on a small trade they looked up with their smiling faces into his and he grinned at them in return and then they said have you got any for us today on which he set down his basket before them and told them they might have one or two if they pleased and down they knelt upon the pavement examining the contents of his basket and talked in almost breathless whispers to each other of the respective merits the softness colour and prettiness of what do you think at the first moment number 6 being engrossed by the story could not guess at all but in another instant she recollected and exclaimed oh aunt judy do you mean those were the rabbit tails you told about they were indeed number 6 replied aunt judy their grandmamma's cook had given them one or two some time before and there being but few entertaining games which two children can play at alone and these poor little things being a good deal left to themselves had invented a play of their own out of the rabbit's tails i think the pleasant feel of the fur which was so nice to cuddle and kiss helped them to this odd liking but whatever may have been the cause certain it is they did get quite fond of them pretended that they could feel and were real living things and talked of them and to them as if they were a party of children they called them tods and toddies but they had all sorts of names besides to distinguish one from the other there was whitey and browny and softy and snuggy and stripy and many others they knew almost every hair of each of them and i believe could have told which was which in the dark merely by their feel this sounds ridiculous enough does it not number 6 said aunt judy interrupting herself number 6 smiled but she was too much interested to wish to talk so the story proceeded now you must know that i have looked rather curiously at hares and rabbits tails myself since i first heard the story and there actually is more variety in them than you would suppose some are nice little fat things almost round with the hair close and fine others longer and more skinny and with poor hair although what there is may be of a handsome color and as to color even in rabbit tails which are white underneath there are all shades from gray to dark brown one on the upper side 
and the patterns and markings differ as you know they do on the fur of a cat in short there really is a choice even in hares and rabbits tails and the more you look at them the more delicate distinctions you will see well the poor little girls knew all about this and a great deal more i dare say than i have noticed for they had played at fancy life with them till the tods had become far more to them than any toys they possessed actually in fact things to love and i dare say if we could have watched them at night putting their tods to bed we should have seen every one of them kissed it was a capital thing as you may suppose for keeping the children quiet as well as happy in the nursery at the top of the london house in one particular corner of which the basket of the tods was kept but when grandmamma's bell rang which it did day by day as a summons after the parlour breakfast was over the tods were put away and it was dolls or reasonable toys of some description which the motherless little girls took down with them to the drawing-room and i doubt whether either grandmamma or aunt knew of the tod family in the basket upstairs after the affair had gone on for a little time the children were accidentally in the kitchen when the rabbit skin dealer called and the cook begged him to give them a tale or two and henceforth of course they looked upon him as one of their greatest friends and if they wanted fresh tods they would lie in wait for him in the archway entrance for fear he should go by without coming in to call at their grandmamma's house and on the day i have described two new brothers furry and buffy were introduced to the tod establishment and the talking and delight that ensued lasted for the whole afternoon nobody knew i believe but certainly if anybody had known how the hearts of those children were getting involved over the dead rabbit's tails it would have been only right to have tried to lead their affection into some better direction what a waste of good emotions it was when they cuddled up their tods in an evening invented histories of what they had said and done during the day and put them by at last with caresses something very nearly akin to human love oh dear aunt judy exclaimed number six if their poor mamma had but been there all would have been right then would it not number six number six said yes from the very depths of her heart as it seems to us you should say continued aunt judy but that is all it could not have seemed so to the god who took their mother away aunt judy number six i am telling you a very serious truth had it indeed been right for the children that their mother should have lived she would not have been taken away for some reason or other it was necessary that they should be without the comfort and help and protection of her presence in this world we cannot understand it but a time may come when we may see it all as clearly as we now see the folly of those children who so doted upon senseless rabbits tails oh aunt judy but it was still very very sad yes about that there cannot be a doubt but i am as much inclined as anybody else to say poor little things every time i mention them but now let me go on with the story for it has a lot of end as well as beginning the tod affair came at last to their grandmamma's ears i am so glad cried number 6 you will not say so when i tell you how it happened was aunt judy's rejoinder the fact was that one unfortunate day one of the tods disappeared whether it had been left out of the basket where grandmamma's bell rang and so got swept away by the nurse and burnt i cannot say but at any rate when the children went to their play one morning softy their dear little softy was gone he was the fattest furred and finest head of all the tod family and the one about whom they invented the prettiest stories he was in fact the model the out of the way amiable pattern tod they could not believe at first that he was really gone they hunted for him in every hole and corner of their nursery and bedroom they looked for him all along the passages they tossed all the other tods out of the basket to find him as if they really were even in their eyes 
nothing but rabbit's tails they asked all the servants about him till everybody's patience was exhausted and they got angry and then at last the children's hope and temper were both exhausted too and they broke out into passionate crying this was vexatious to the nurse of course but her method of consolation was not very judicious why bless my heart was her beginning what nonsense didn't the children know as well as she did that hares and rabbits tails were not alive and couldn't feel and what could it signify of one of them was thrown away and lost they'd a basket full left besides and it was plenty of such rubbish as that they were all very well to play with up in the nursery but were they worth nothing when all was said and done this was completely in vain of course the children sat on the nursery floor and cried on just the same and by and by went away to the corner of the room where the tod basket was kept and bewailed the loss of poor softy to his brothers and sisters inside as the time approached however for grandmamma's summoning bell the nurse began to wonder what she could do to stop this fretting and cool the red eyes so she tried the coaxing plan by way of a change if she was such nice little girls with beautiful dolls and toys she never would fret so about a rabbit's tail to be sure and besides the boy was sure to be round again very soon with the hair and rabbit skins and if they would only be good and dry their eyes she would get him to give them as many more as they pleased quite fresh new ones she dared say they would be as pretty again as the one that was lost if nurse had wished to hit upon an injudicious remark she could not have succeeded better what did they care for fresh new tods instead of their dear softy and the mere suggestion that any others could be prettier turned their regretful love into a sort of passionate indignation yet the nurse had meant well and was astonished when the conclusion of what was intended to be a kind harangue was followed by a louder burst of crying than ever it must be owned that the little girls had by this time got out of grief into naughtiness and there was now quite as much petted temper as sorrow in their tears and lo while they were in the midst of this fretful condition grandmamma's summoning bell was heard and they were obliged to go down to her you can just imagine their appearance when they entered the drawing-room with their eyes red and swelled their cheeks flushed and anything but a pleasant expression over their faces of course grandmamma and aunt immediately made inquiries as to the reason of so much disturbance but the children were scarcely able to utter the usual good morning and when called upon to tell their cause of trouble did nothing but begin to cry afresh whereupon their aunt was dispatched upstairs to find out what was amiss and then for the first time she heard from the nurse the history of the todd family the children's devotion to them and their present vexatious grief about the loss of a solitary one of what she called their stupid bits of nonsense foolish as the whole affair sounds in looking back upon it certainly was one which required rather delicate handling and i doubt whether anybody but a mother could have handled it properly grandmamma and aunt had every wish to do for the best but they hardly took enough into consideration either the bereaved condition of those motherless little ones or their highly fanciful turn of mind yet nobody was to blame the children spent all the summer with their father in the country and all the winter with their grandmamma in london and therefore no continued knowledge of their characters was possible for they were always birds of passage everywhere certainly however it was a great mistake under such circumstances for grandmamma and aunt to have broken rudely into the one stronghold of childish comfort which they had raised up for themselves aunt judy paused and number six really looked frightened as to what was coming next and asked what aunt judy could mean that they did were they very angry no they were not very angry aunt judy said 
perhaps if they had been only that the whole thing would have passed over and been forgotten but they held grave consultation upon the subject and made it too serious in my opinion and i dare say you will think so too meantime the naughty children were turned out of the room while they talked and the mystery of this sobered their temper considerably so that they made no further disturbance but wandered up and down the stairs and about the hall in silent discomfort at one time they thought they heard the drawing-room door open and their aunt go upstairs towards the nursery department again but then for a long while they heard no more and at last childlike began to amuse themselves by seeing how far along the oilcloth pattern they could each step as they walked the length of the hall the great object being to stretch from one particular diamond to another without touching any intermediate mark in the midst of the excitement of this they heard their aunt's voice calling to them from the middle of the last flight of stairs there was something in her face composed as it was which alarmed them directly and there they stood quite still gazing at her grandmamma and i she began think you have been very silly indeed in making such a fuss about those rabbits tails and you have been very naughty indeed to say very naughty in crying so ridiculously and teasing all the servants because of one being lost you can't play with them rationally nurse is sure and so we think you will be very much better without them grandmamma has sent me to tell you you will never see the tods as you call them any more aunt judy it was horrible cried number six savage and horrible she repeated and burst the next instant into a flood of tears oh my old darling number six cried aunt judy covering the sobbing child quite round with both her arms surely you are not going into hysterics about the rabbit's tails too i doubt if even their little mammas did that come you must cheer up or mamma will have to be sent for to say that if you are so unreasonable you must never listen to aunt judy's stories any more number six's emotion began to subside under the comfortable embrace and aunt judy's joke provoked a smile there now that's good cried aunt judy and now if you won't be ridiculous i will finish the story i almost think the prettiest part is to come this was consolation indeed but number six could not resist a remark but aunt judy wasn't that aunt hush hush interrupted aunt judy i apologized for both aunt and grandmamma before i told you what they did they meant to do for the best and the best can do no more they cured the evil too though in what you and i think rather a rough manner and rough treatment is sometimes very effectual however unpleasant it was but a preparation for the much harder disappointments of older life poor little things ejaculated number six once more just tell me if they cried dreadfully i don't think i care to talk much about that dear number six answered her sister they had cried almost as much as they could do in one day and were stupefied by the new misfortune besides which they all had a feeling all the time of having brought it on themselves by being dreadfully naughty it was a sad muddle altogether i must confess the shock upon the poor children's mind at the time must have been very great for the memory of that bereavement clung to them through grown-up life as a very unpleasant recollection when a thousand more important things had passed away forgotten from their thoughts in fact as i said the motherless little girls really broke their hearts over a parcel of rabbit's tails but i must go on with the story after a day or two of dull desolation the children wearied even of their grief and both grandmamma and aunt became very sorry for them although the fatal subject of the tods was never mentioned but they bought them several beautiful toys to which no child could help looking at or being pleased with 
among these presents was a brown fur dog with a very nice face and a pair of bright black eyes and a curly tail hung over his back in a particularly graceful manner and this was as you may suppose in the children's eyes the gem of all their new treasures the feel of him reminded them of the lost tods and in every respect he was of course superior they named him carlo and in a quiet manner established him as the favourite creature of their play and thus by degrees and as time went on their grief for the loss of the tods abated somewhat and at last they began to talk about them to each other which was a sure sign that their feelings were softened but you will never guess what turn their conversation took they did not begin to say how sorry they had been or were nor did they make any angry remarks about their aunt's cruelty but one day as they were sitting playing with carlo in what may be called the tot corner of the nursery the eldest child said suddenly to her sister in a low voice what do you think our aunt has really done with the tods a question which seemed not at all to surprise the other for she answered in the same mysterious tone i don't know but i don't think she could burn them and i don't either was the rejoinder perhaps she has only put them somewhere where we cannot get them the next idea came from the younger child do you think she'll ever let us have them back again but the answer to this was a long shake of the head from the wiser elder sister and then they began to play with carlo again but after that day they used often to exchange a few words together on the subject although only to the same effect their aunt could not have burnt them they felt sure she never said she had burnt them she only said you will never see the tods any more perhaps she had only put them by perhaps she had put them in some comfortable place perhaps they were in their little basket in some closet or corner of the house quite as snug as up in the nursery and here the conversation would break off again as to asking any questions of their aunt that was a thing that never crossed their minds it was impossible the subject was so fatally serious but i believe there was an involuntary peeping about into closets and out of the way places whenever opportunity offered yet no result followed and the tods were not found one night two or three months later and just before the little things were moved back from london to their country home and when they were in bed in their sleeping room as usual and the nurse had left them and had shut the door between them and the day nursery where she sat at work the elder child called out in a whisper to the younger one sister are you asleep no why i'll tell you of a place where the thoughts may be where the cellar do you think so yes i think we've looked everywhere else and i think perhaps it's very nice down there with bits of sawdust here and there on the ground i saw some on the bottle today and it was quite soft aunt would be quite sure we should never see them there i dare say it's very snug indeed all among the barrels and empty bottles in that cellar we once peeped into the younger child here began to laugh in delighted amusement but the elder one bade her hush or the nurse would hear them and then proceeded whispering as before it's a great big place and they could each have a house and visit each other and hide and make fun and i dare say softy was put there first interposed the younger sister ay and how pleased the others would be to find him there only think and they did think poor little things they lay and thought of that meeting when the others were put in the cellar where softy already was ready to welcome them to his new home and they talked of all that might have happened on such an occasion and told each other that the tods were much happier altogether there than if the others had remained in the nursery separated from dear little softy in short they talked till the door opened and the nurse unsuspicious of the state of her young charges went to bed herself and sleep fell on the whole party but a new world had now opened before them out of the very midst of their sorrow itself 
the fancy home of the tots was almost a more available source of amusement than even playing with the real things had been and sometimes in the early morning sometimes for the precious half-hour at night before sleep overtook them the little wits went to work with fresh details and suppositions and they related to each other in turns the imaginary events of the day in the cellar among the barrels each morning when they went downstairs carlo was put in the tot corner of the nursery and instructed to slip away as soon as he could manage it to the tots in the cellar and hear all they had been about and marvellous tales mr carlo used to bring back if the children's accounts to each other were to be trusted such running about to be sure took place among those barrels and empty bottles such playing at bo peep such visits of furry and his family to puffy and his family and the little furries and buffies could not be kept in order but would go peeping into bunk holes and tumbling nearly through and having to be picked out by carlo drabbled and chilled but ready for a fresh frolic five minutes after such comical disputes too they had as to how far the grounds round each tot's house extended such funny adventures of getting into their neighbour's corner instead of their own in the dim light had prevailed and being mistaken for a thief when carlo had to come and act as judge among them and make them kiss and be friends all round such dinners too carlo brought them as he passed through the kitchen on his road to the cellar and watched his opportunity to carry off a few unmissed little bits for his friends below dear me his contrivances on that score were endless and the odd things he got hold of sometimes by mistake in his hurry were enough to kill the tots with laughing to say nothing of the children who were inventing the history then the care they took to save the little drops at the bottom of the bottles for carlo in return for all the trouble he had was most praiseworthy and sometimes when there was a rather large quantity than usual they would have such a feast and drink the healths of their dear little mistresses in the nursery upstairs in short it was as perfect a fancy as their love for the tods and their ideas of enjoyment could make it nothing uncomfortable nothing sad was ever heard of in that cellar home of their lost pets no quarrelling no crying no naughtiness no unkindness was supposed to trouble it nothing was known of there but comfort and fun and innocent blunders and jokes which ended in fun and comfort again one thing therefore you see was established as certain throughout the whole of the childish dream the departed favourites were all perfectly happy as happy as it was possible to be and they sent loving messages by carlo to their old friends to say so and to beg them not to be sorry for them for excepting that they would like some day to see those old friends again they had nothing left to wish for in their new home and here the todd story ends remarked aunt judy in conclusion and i beg you to observe number six that like all my stories it ends happily the children had now got hold of an amusement which was safe from interference and which lasted i am really afraid to say how long or even after the fervour of their todd love had abated they found an endless source of invention and enjoyment in the cellar home romance and told each other anecdotes about it from time to time for more i believe than a year when aunt judy paused here as if expecting some remark all that number six could say was poor little things ay they were still that exclaimed aunt judy even in the midst of their new-found comfort oh number six when one thinks of the strange way in which they first of all created a sorrow for themselves and then devised for themselves its consolation what a pity it seems that no good was got out of it it was not likely that number six should guess what the good was which aunt judy thought might have been got out of it and so she said whereupon aunt judy exclaimed did it not offer a quite natural opportunity if any kind friend had but known of it of speaking to those children of some of the sacred hopes of our christian faith of leading them through kind talk about their own pretty fancies to the subject of what really becomes of their dear friends who are taken away from us by death 
had i been there aunt judy she continued i should have thought it no cruelty but kindness then to have spoken to them about their lost mother and told them that she was living now in a place where she was much much happier than that she had ever been before and where one of the very few things she had left to wish for was that one day she might see them again not in this world where people are so uncomfortable and sad but in that happy one where there is no more sorrow or crying for god himself wipes away the tears from all eyes i should have told them besides pursued aunt judy that it would not please their dear mother at all for them to fret for her and fancy they couldn't do without her and be discontented because god had taken her away and think it would have been much better for them if he had not done so as if he did not know a thousand times better than they could do but that it would please her very much for them to pray to god to make them good so that they might all meet together at last in that very happy place in short number six i would have led them if possible to make a comforting reality to themselves of the next world as they had already got a comforting fancy out of the cellar dream of the tods and that is the good dear child which i meant might have been got out of the tod adventure aunt judy ceased but there was no chance of seeing the effect of what she had said on number six's face for it was laid on her sister's lap probably to hide the tears which would come into her eyes at aunt judy's allusion to what she had said about her at last a rather husky voice spoke you can't expect people to like what is so sad even if it is what you call right and all that no neither does god expect it was aunt judy's earnest reply we are allowed to be sorry when trials come for we feel the suffering and cannot at present understand the blessing or necessity of it but we are not allowed to sorrow without hope and we are not allowed even when we are most sorry to be rebellious and fancy we could choose better than god chooses for us and aunt judy's lesson as well as story was ended now and she began talking over the entertaining part of the todd history and then went on to other things till number six was quite herself again and wanted to know how much was true about the motherless little girls and when she found from aunt judy's answer that the account was by no means altogether an invention she went into fever fidget to know who the children were and what had become of them and finally settled that the one thing in the world she most wished for was to see them nor would she be persuaded that this was a foolish idea until aunt judy asked her how she would like to be introduced to a couple of very old women with huge hooked noses and beardy nutcracker chins and be told that those were the motherless little girls who had broken their hearts over rabbit's tails an inquiry which tickled number six's fancy immensely so that she began to laugh and suggest a few additions of her own to the comical picture in the course of doing which she fortunately quite lost sight of the one thing which a few minutes before she had most wished for in the world End of section four. Section five. Out of the way, part one. O oh, wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. Hamlet. What a horrid nuisance you are, number eight, brushing everything down as you go by. Why can't you keep out of the way? Oh, you mustn't come here, number eight. Aunt Judy look he's sitting on my doll's best cloak do tell him to go away i can't have you bothering me number eight don't you see how busy i am packing get away somewhere else you should squeeze yourself into less than nothing and be nowhere number eight the suggestion uttered with a jocose grin came from a small boy who had ensconced himself in the corner of a window where he was sitting on his heels painting the union jack of a ship in the illustrated london news he had certainly acted on the advice he gave as nearly as was possible surely no little boy of his age ever got into so small a compass before or in a position more effectually out of everybody's possible way the window corner led nowhere 
and there was nothing in it for anybody to want number eight i never saw anything so tiresome as you are why will you poke your nose in where you're not wanted you're always in the way he poked his flat nose into every place sung sotto voce by the small boy in the window corner number eight did not stop to dispute about it though in point of fact his nose was not flat so at least in that respect he did not resemble the duck in the song he had not however been successful in gaining the attention of his friends downstairs so he dawdled off to make an experiment in another quarter why you're not coming into the nursery now master eight surely i can't do with you fidgeting about among all the clothes and packing there isn't a minute to spare you might keep out of the way till i've finished now master eight you must be off there's no time or room for you in the kitchen this morning there's ever so many things to get ready yet run away as fast as you can what are you doing in the passages number eight don't you see that you are in everybody's way you had really better go to bed again but the speaker hurried forward and number eight betook himself to the staircase and sat down exactly in the middle of the middle flight and there be amused himself by peeping through the banisters into the hall where people were passing backwards and forwards in a great fuss or listening to the talking and noise that were going on in the rooms above but he was not out of the way there as he soon learnt heavy steps were presently heard along the landing and heavy steps began to descend the stairs two men were carrying down a heavy trunk you'll have to move young gentleman if you please observed one you're right in the way just there number eight descended with all possible speed and arrived on the mat at the bottom there now i told you you were always in the way was the greeting he received how stupid it is try under the table for pity's sake under the table it was not a bad idea moreover it was a new one quite a fresh plan number eight grinned and obeyed the hall table was no bad asylum after all for a little boy who was always in the way everywhere else besides he could see everything that was going on number eight crept under and squatted himself on the coconut matting he looked up and looked around and felt rather as if he was in a tent only with a very substantial covering over his head presently the dog passed by and was soon coaxed to lie down in the table retreat by the little boy's side and the two amused themselves very nicely together the fact was the family were going from home and the least the little ones could do during the troublesome preparation was not to be troublesome themselves but this is sometimes rather a difficult thing for little ones to accomplish nevertheless number eight had accomplished it at last capital number eight you and the dog are quite a picture if i had time i would make a sketch of you that was the remark of the first person who went by afterwards and number eight grinned as he heard it well done number eight that's the best contrivance i ever saw remark the second followed by a second grin why you don't mean to say that you're under the table master eight well you are a good boy i'm sure i'll tell your mamma another grin you dear old fellow to put yourself so nicely out of the way you're worth i don't know what grin again master number eight under the table to be sure well and a very nice place it is and quite suitable ever so much better than the hot kitchen when there's baking and all sorts of things going on here lovey here's a little cake that was spared that i was taking to the parlour but as you're there you shall have it number eight grinned with all his heart this time i wish i'd thought of that why i could have painted my ship there without being squeezed it need scarcely to be told that this was the observation of the small boy who had watched an opportunity for emerging from the window corner without fuss and was now carrying his little paint box upstairs to be packed away in the children's bag as he spoke he stooped down to look at number eight and the dog and smiled his approbation 
and number eight smiled in return number eight how snug you do look once more an answering grin number eight you're the best boy in the world and if you stay there till nurse is ready for you you shall have a penny all to yourself number eight's grin was accompanied by a significant nod this time to show that he had accepted the bargain my darling number eight you may come out now there give me a kiss and get dressed as fast as you can the fly will be here directly you're a very good boy indeed Number eight, you're the pattern boy of the family, and I shall come with you in the fly and tell you a story as we go along for a reward. Number eight liked both the praise and the cake and the penny and the kiss and the promise of the rewarding story for going under the table, but the why and wherefore of all these charming facts was a complete mystery to him. What did that matter, however? He ran upstairs and got dressed and was ready before anyone else and by a miracle of good fortune was on the steps and not in the middle of the carriage drive when the fly arrived, which was to take one batch of the large family party to the railway station. No one was as fond of the fly conveyance as of the open carriage, for in the first place it was usually very full and stuffy and in the second very little of the country could be seen from the windows. But on the present occasion, Aunt Judy having offered her services to accompany the fly detachment, there was a wonderful alteration of sentiment as to who should be included. Aunt Judy, however, had her own ideas. The three little ones belonged to the fly, as it were by ancient usage and custom, and more than five it would not hold. Five it would hold, however, and five accordingly got in, number four having pleaded her own cause to be thrown in, and at last, with nurses and luggage and number five outside, away they drove, leaving the open carriage and the rest to follow. Nothing is perfect in this world. Those who had the airy drive missed the story and regretted it, but it was fair that the pleasure should be divided. And after all, although the fly might be a little stuffy and closely packed, and although it cost some trouble to settle down without getting crushed, and make footstools of carpet bags, and let down all the windows, the commotion was soon over. And it was a wonderful lull of peace and quietness, after the confusion and worry of packing and running about, to sit even in a rattling fly. And so for five minutes and more, all the travellers felt it to be, and a soothing silence ensued, some leaning back, others looking silently out at the retreating landscape, or studying with earnestness the wonderful red plush lining of the vehicle itself. But presently, after the rest had lasted sufficiently long to recruit all the spirits, number seven remarked, not speaking to anybody in particular, I thought Aunt Judy was going to tell us a story. Number seven was a great smiler in a quiet way, and he smiled now, as he addressed his remark to the general contents of the fly. Aunt Judy laughed and inquired for whom the observation was meant, adding a readiness to begin, if they would agree to sit quiet and comfortable, without shuffling up and down, or disputing about space and heat. And these points being agreed to, she began her story as follows. There were once upon a time a man and his wife who had an only son. They were Germans, I believe, for all the funny things that happen, happen in Germany, as you know, by Grimm's fairy tales. Well, this man Franz had been a watchmaker and mender in an old-fashioned country town, and he had made such a comfortable fortune by the business that he was able to retire before he grew very old. And so he bought a very pretty little villa in the outskirts of the town, had a garden full of flowers and a fountain in the middle, and enjoyed himself very much. His wife enjoyed herself too, but never so much as when the neighbours, as they passed by, peeped over the palings and said, What a pretty place! What lucky people the watchmaker and his wife are! How they must enjoy themselves! On such occasions, Madame Franz would run to her husband, crying out, Come here, my dear, as fast as you can. Come and listen to the neighbours saying how we must enjoy ourselves. Franz was very apt to crunt when his wife summoned him in this manner, and at any rate, 
never would go as she requested but little franz his son who was very much like his mother and had got exactly her turn-up nose and sharp eyes would scamper forward in a moment to hear what the neighbours had to say and at the end would exclaim isn't it grandmother that everybody should think that to which his mother would reply it is franz dear i'm so glad you feel for your mother and then the two would embrace each other very affectionately several times and madame franz would go to her household business rejoicing to think that if her husband did not quite sympathize with her her son did young franz had been somewhat spoiled in his childhood as only children generally are as to his mother from there being no brothers and sisters to compare him with she thought such a boy had never been seen before and she told old franz so so often that at last he began to believe it too and then they got all sorts of masters for him to teach him everything they could think of and qualify him as his mother said for some rich young lady to fall in love with. that was her idea of the way in which he was one day to make his fortune at last a time came when his mother thought the young gentleman quite finished and complete fit for anything in anybody and likely to create a sensation in the world so she begged old franz to dismiss all his masters and give him a handsome allowance that he might go off on his travels and make his fortune in the manner before mentioned old mr franz shook his head at first and called it all a parcel of nonsense moreover he declared that master franz was a mere child yet and would get into a hundred foolish scrapes in less than a week but mamma expressed her opinion so positively and repeated it so often that at last papa began to entertain it too and gave his consent to the plan the fact was though i am sorry to say it mr franz was henpecked that is his wife was always trying to make him obey her instead of obeying him as she ought to have done and she had managed him so long that she knew she could persuade him or talk him which is much the same thing into anything provided she went on long enough so she went on about franz going off on his travels with a handsome allowance till papa franz consented and settled an income upon him which if they had been selfish parents they would have said they could not afford but as it was they talked the matter over together and told each other that it was very little two old souls like themselves would want when their gay son was away and so they would draw in and live quite quietly as they used to do in their early days before they grew rich and would let the lad have the money to spend upon his amusements young franz either didn't know or didn't choose to think about this clever as he was about many things he was not clever enough to take in the full value of the sacrifices his parents were making for him so he thanked them lightly for the promised allowance rattled the first payment cheerfully into his purse and smiled on papa and mamma with almost condescending complacency when he was equipped in his best suit and just ready for starting his mother took him aside franz my dear you know how much money and pains have been spent on your education you can play dance and sing and talk and make yourself heard wherever you go now mind you do make yourself heard for who is to find out your merits don't be shy and downcast when you come among strangers all you have to think about with your advantages is to make yourself agreeable that's the rule for you make yourself agreeable wherever you go and the wife and the fortune will soon be at your feet and franz continued she laying hold of the button of his coat there is something else you know i have often said that the one only thing i could wish different about you is that your nose should not turn up quite so much but you see my darling boy we can't alter our noses nevertheless look here you can incline your head in such a manner as almost to hide the little defect see this way there let me put it as i mean a little down and on one side it was the way i used to carry my head before i married or i doubt very much whether your father would have looked my way think of this when you are in company it's a graceful attitude too and you will find it much admired 
Franz embraced his mother and promised obedience to all her commands, but he was glad when her lecture ended, for he was not very fond of her remarks upon his nose. Just then the door of his father's room opened, and he called out, Franz, my dear, I want to speak to you. Franz entered the room, and, Now, my dear boy, said Papa, before you go, let me give you one word of parting advice. But stop, we will shut the door first, if you please. That's right. Well, now, look here. I know that no pains of expense have been spared over your education. You can play and dance and sing and talk, and make yourself heard wherever you go. My dear sir, interrupted Franz, I don't think you need trouble yourself to go on. My mother has just been giving me the advice beforehand. No, has she though, cried old Franz, looking up in his son's face. But then he shook his head and said, No, she hasn't, Franz. No, she hasn't. So listen to me. We've all made a fuss about you and praised whatever you've done. And you've been a sort of idol and wonder amongst us. But now you're going among strangers. You will find yourself Mr. Nobody. And the great thing is, you must be contented to be Mr. Nobody at first. Keep yourself in the background till people have found out your merits for themselves and never get into anybody's way. Keep out of the way, in fact. That's the safest rule. It's the secret of life for a young man. How impatient you look. But mark my words, all you have to attend to with your advantages is to keep out of the way. After this bit of advice, the father bestowed his blessing on his dear Franz and unlocked the door, close to which they found Mrs. Franz, waiting rather impatiently till the conference was over. What a time you have been, Franz, she began, but there was no time to talk about it, for they all knew that the coach or post wagon, as they call it in Germany, was waiting. Mrs. Franz wrung her son's hand. Remember what I've said, my dearest Franz, she cried. Trust me, was Mr. Franz's significant reply. You'll not forget my rule, whispered Papa. Forget it, sir. No, that's not possible, answered Mr. Franz in a great hurry, as he ran off to catch the post wagon, for they could see it in the distance beginning to move, though part of the young gentleman's luggage was on board. Well, he was just in time. But what do you think was the next thing he did? After keeping the people waiting, a sudden thought struck him that it would be as well for the driver and passengers to know how well educated he had been. So he began to give the driver a few words of geographical information about the roads they were going. Jump in directly, sir, if you please, was the driver's gruff reply. Certainly not, till I've made you understand what I mean, says Master Franz quite facetiously. But then smack went the whip and the horses gave a jolt forwards. And over the tip of the learned young gentleman's foot went the front wheel. It was a nasty squeeze, though it might have been worse. But Franz called out very angrily, something or other about disgraceful carelessness, on which the driver smacked his whip again and shouted, Gentlemen that won't keep out of the way must expect to have their toes trodden on. Everybody laughed at this, but Franz was obliged to spring inside without taking any notice of the joke, as the coach was now really going on, and if he had begun to talk, he would have been left behind. And now continued Aunt Judy, stopping herself, while Franz is jolting along to the capital town of the country, you shall tell me whose advice you think he followed when he got to the end of the journey and began life for himself, his father's or his mother's. There was a universal cry, mixed with laughter, of his mother's. Quite right, responded Aunt Judy. His mother's, of course. It was far the most agreeable, no doubt. Keeping out of the way is a rather difficult thing for young folks to manage. A glance at number eight caused that young gentleman's face to grin all over, and Aunt Judy proceeded. After his arrival at the great hotel of the town, he found there was to be a public dinner there that evening, which anybody might go to, who chose to pay for it. And this, he thought, would be a capital opportunity for him to begin life. So, accordingly, he went upstairs to dress himself out in his very best clothes for the occasion. And then it was that, as he sat in front of the glass, looking at his own face while he was brushing his hair and whiskers and brightening them up with bear's grease, 
he began to think of his father and mother and what they had said and what he had best do an excellent well-meaning couple of course but as old-fashioned as the clocks they used to mend was his first thought as to papa indeed the poor old gentleman thinks the world has stood still since he was a young man thirty years ago his stiff notions were all very well then perhaps but in these advanced times they are perfectly quizzical keep out of the way indeed why any ignoramus can do that i should think well well he means well all the same so one must not be severe as to mamma now poor thing though she is behind hand herself in many ways yet she does know a good thing when she sees it and that's a great point she can appreciate the probable results of my very superior education and appearance to be sure she's a little silly over that nose affair but women will always be silly about something nevertheless at this point in his meditations master franz might have been inclining his head down on one side just as his mother had recommended and then giving a look at the mirror to see the vile turn-up did really disappear in that attitude i suspect however that he did not feel quite satisfied about it for he got rather cross and finished his dressing in a great hurry but not before he had settled that there could be only one opinion as to whose advice he should be guided by dear mamas should it fail concluded he to himself as he gave the last smile at the looking-glass there will be poor papa's old-world notion to fall back upon after all now you must know that master franz had never been at one of these public dinners before so there is no denying that when he entered the large dining-hall where there was a long table set out with plates and which was filling fast with people not one of whom he knew he felt a little confused but he repeated his mother's words softly to himself and took courage don't be shy and downcast when you come among strangers all you have to think about with your advantages is to make yourself agreeable and on the strength of this he passed by the lower end of the table where there were several unoccupied places and walked boldly forward to the upper end where groups of people were already seated and were talking and laughing together in the midst of one of these groups there was one unoccupied seat and in the one next to it sat a beautiful well-dressed young lady why this is the very thing thought mr franz to himself who knows but what this is the young lady who is to make my fortune there was a card it is true in the plate in front of the vacant seat but as to that thought franz first come first served i suppose i shall sit down and sit down the young gentleman accordingly did in the chair by the beautiful young lady and even bowed and smiled to her as he did so but in the next instant he was tapped on the shoulder by a waiter the place is engaged sir and the man pointed to the card and the plate oh if that's all was mr franz's witty rejoinder there's another to match and thereupon he drew one of his own cards from his pocket threw it into the plate and handed the first one to the astonished waiter with the remark the place is engaged my good friend you see the young goose actually thought this impudence clever and glanced across the table to applause as he spoke but although mamma watchmaker if she had heard it might have thought it a piece of astonishing wit the strangers at the public table were quite of a different opinion and there was a general cry of turn him out turn me out shouted mr franz jumping up from his chair as if he intended to fight them all round and there is no knowing what more nonsense he might not have talked but that a very sonorous voice behind him called out a hand lay hold of him by the shoulders at the same time young man i'll trouble you to get out of my chair and a little louder out of my way and a little louder still to keep out of my way end of section five out of the way part two franz felt himself like a child in the grasp of the man who spoke and one glimpse he caught of a pair of coal-black eyes two frowning eyebrows and a mustachioed mouth nearly frightened him out of his wits and he was half way down the room before he knew what was happening for after the baron let him go 
The waiter seized him and hustled him along till he came to the bottom of the table, where, however, there was no room for him. As all the vacant places had been filled up, so he was pushed finally to a side table in a corner at which sat two men in foreign dresses, not one word of whose language he could understand. These two fellows talked incessantly together too, which was all the more mortifying, because they gesticulated and laughed as if at some capital joke. Franz was very quiet at first, for the other adventure had sobered him, but presently, with his mother's advice running in his head, he resolved to make himself agreeable, if possible. So, at the next burst of merriment, he affected to have entered into the joke, threw himself back in his chair, and laughed as loudly as they did. The men stared for a second, then frowned, and then one of them shouted something to him very loudly, which he did not understand. So he placed his hand on his heart, put on an expressive smile, and offered to shake hands. Thought he, that will be irresistible. But he was mistaken. The other man now called loudly to the waiter, and a moment after Franz found himself being conveyed by the said waiter through the doorway into the hall, with the remark resounding in his ears, "'What a foolish young gentleman you must be! Why can't you keep out of people's way?' "'My good friend,' cried Mr. Franz, "'that's not my plan at present. I'm trying to make myself agreeable.' oh pooh bother agreeable cried the waiter what's the use of making yourself agreeable if you're always in the way here step back sir don't you see the trace come in franz had not noticed it and would probably have got a thump on the head from it if his friend the waiter had not pulled him back the man was a real good-natured smiling german and said come my gentleman here's a candle you've a bedroom here of course now you take my advice and go to bed you will be out of the way there and perhaps you'll get up wiser tomorrow franz took the candlestick mechanically but said he i understood there was to be some dancing here tonight and i can dance and oh pooh bother dancing interrupted the waiter what's the use of dancing if you're to be in everybody's way and i know you will you can't help it here be advised for once and go to bed i'll bring you up some coffee before long go quietly up now mine good night two minutes afterwards mr franz found himself walking upstairs as the waiter had ordered him to do though he muttered something about officious fellow as he went along and positively he went to bed as the officious fellow recommended and while he lay there waiting for the coffee he began wondering what could be the cause of the failure of his attempts to make himself agreeable surely his mother was right surely there could be no doubt that with his advantages but he did not go on with the sentence well, after puzzling for some time, a bright thought struck him. It was entirely owing to that stupid nose affair, which his mother was so silly about. Of course, that was it. He had done everything else she recommended, but he could not keep his head down. At the same time, so people saw the snub. Well, he would practice the attitude now, at any rate, till the coffee came. No sooner said than done, out of bed jumped Mr. Franz, and went groping about for the table to find matches to light the candle. But unluckily he had forgotten how the furniture stood, so he got to the door by a mistake, and went stumbling up against it, just as the waiter with the coffee opened it on the other side. There was a plunge, a shout, a shuffling of feet, and then both were on the floor, and was also the hot coffee, which scalded Franz's bare legs terribly. The waiter got up first, and luckily it was the officious fellow, with the smiling face, and said he, What a miserable young man you must be, to be sure! Why, you're never out of the way! Not even when you're gone to bed! This last anecdote caused an uproar of delight in the fly, and so much noise, 
that Aunt Judy had to call the party to order and talk about the horses being frightened, after which she proceeded. I am sorry to say Mr. Franz did not get up the next morning, as much wiser as the waiter had expected for he laid all the blame of his misfortunes on his nose instead of his impertinence, and never thought of correcting himself and being less intrusive. On the contrary, after practising holding his head down for ten minutes before the glass, he went out to the day's amusements as saucy and confident as ever. Now there is no time, continued Aunt Judy for my telling you all Mr. Franz's funny scrapes and adventures. When we get to the end of the journey, you must invent some for yourselves, and sit together, and tell them in turns, while we are busy unpacking. I will only just say, that wherever he went, the same sort of things happened to him, because he was always thrusting himself forward, and always getting pushed back in consequence. Out of the public gardens he got fairly turned at last because he would talk politics to some strange gentleman on a bench. They got up and walked away, but five minutes afterwards, a very odd-looking man looked over Franz's shoulder and said significantly, I recommend you to leave these gardens, sir, and walk elsewhere. And poor Franz, who had heard of such things as prisons and dungeons for political offenders, felt a cold shudder run through him and took himself off with all possible speed, not daring to look behind him, for fear he should see that dreadful man at his heels. Indeed, he never felt safe till he was in his bedroom again, and had got the waiter to come and talk to him. "'Dear me,' said the waiter, "'what a silly young gentleman you must be to go talking away without being asked!' But, said Franz, you don't consider what a superior education I have had. I can talk and make myself heard. Oh, pooh! bother talking, interrupted the waiter. What's the use of talking when nobody wants to listen? Much better go to bed. Franz would not give in yet, but was comforted to find the waiter did not think he would be thrown into prisons and dungeons. So he dined and dressed and went to the theatre to console himself, where, however, he made himself heard so effectually, first applauding, then hissing, and even speaking his opinions to the people round him, that a set of young college students combined together to get rid of him, and, I am sorry to add, they made use of a little kicking as the surest plan, and so, before half the play was over, Mr. Franz found himself in the street. Now then, I have told you enough of Mr. Franz's follies, except the one last adventure which made him alter his whole plan of proceeding. He had had two letters of introduction to take with him, one to an old partner of his father's who had settled in the capital some years before, another to some people of more consequence, very distant family connections. And, of course, Mr. Franz went there first, as there seemed a nice chance of making his fortune among such great folks. And really the great folks would have been civil though, but that he soon spoilt everything by what he called making himself agreeable. He was too polite, too affectionate, too talkative, too instructive by half. He assured the young ladies that he approved very highly of their singing. Trilled out a little song of his own, unasked, at his first visit fondled the pet lapdog on his knee, congratulated Papa on looking wonderfully well for his age, asked Mamma if she had tried the last new spectacles, and in short gave his opinions and advice and information so freely that as soon as he was gone the whole party exclaimed, What an impertinent jackanapes! A jackanapes being nothing more or less than a human monkey. This went on for some time, for he called very often, being too stupid, in spite of his supposed cleverness, to take the hints that were thrown out, that such repeated visits were not wanted. At last, however, the family got desperate, and one morning when he arrived, having teased them the day before for a couple of hours, he saw nobody in the drawing-room when he was ushered in. Never mind, thought he, they'll be there directly when they know I'm come. And having brought a new song in his pocket, which he had been practising to sing to them, 
he sat down to the piano and began performing alone thinking how charmed they would be to hear such beautiful sounds in the distance but in the middle of his song he heard a discordant shout and jumping up discovered the youngest little missy hid behind the curtain and crying tremendously mr franz became quite theatrical lovely little pet where are your sisters have they left my darling to weep alone they shut the door before i could get through sobbed the lovely little pet and i won't be your darling a bit mr franz laughed heartily and said how clever she was took her on his knee told her her sisters would be back again directly and finished his remark by a kiss unfortunate mr franz the young lady immediately gave him an unmistakable box on the ear with her small fist and vociferated no they won't they won't they'll never come back till you're gone they've gone away to get out of your way because you won't keep out of theirs and you're a forward puppy papa says and can't take a hint and you're always in everybody's way and i'll get out of your way too here the little girl began to kick violently but there was no occasion mr franz set her down and while she ran off to her sisters he rushed back to the hotel and double locked himself into his room after a time however he sent for his friend the waiter for he felt that a talk would do him good but the officious fellow shook his head terribly how many times am i to tell you what a foolish young gentleman you are cried he will you never get up wiser any morning of the year i thought murmured franz in broken almost sobbing accents i thought the young ladies would have been delighted with my song you see i've been so well taught and i can sing oh pooh 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 interrupted the waiter once more but the singing and everything else if you are not been asked much better go to bed poor franz it was hard work to give in and he made a last effort don't you think after all that the prejudice is owing to what i told you about people do dislike a snub nose oh pooh bother a snub nose exclaimed the waiter what will your nose signify if you don't poke it in everybody's way and with this conclusion mr franz was obliged to be content and he ordered his dinner upstairs and prepared himself for an evening of tears and repentance but before the waiter had been gone five minutes he returned with a letter in his hand now here's somebody asking something at last said he for a servant had brought it franz trembled as he took it it was sure to be either a scolding or a summons to prison he thought but no such thing it was an invitation to dinner franz threw it on the floor and kicked it from him he would go nowhere see nobody any more the officious fellow picked it up and read it mr franz said he you mustn't go to bed this time you must go to this dinner instead it's from your father's old partner he wishes you had called but as you haven't called he asks you to dine now you're wanted mr franz and must go i shall get into another mess cried franz despondingly oh pooh you're only going to keep out of everybody's way and all will be right insisted the waiter and left the room only to keep out of everybody's way and all will be right ejaculated mr franz as he looked at his crestfallen face in the glass it's a strange rule for getting on in life however continued he cheering up one plan has failed and it's only fair to give the other a chance and all the rest of dressing time and afterwards as he walked along the streets he kept repeating his father's words softly to himself which was at first a very difficult thing to do because he could not help mixing them up with his mother's it was the funniest thing in the world to hear him all you have to attend to with your advantages is to make yourself no no not to make myself agreeable is to keep out of the way that's it 
when franz arrived at the house he rang the bell so gently that he had to ring twice before he was heard and then they concluded it was some beggar who was afraid of giving a good pull so when he was ushered into the drawing-room the old partner came forward to meet him took him by both hands and after one look into his downcast face said dear mr franz you must put on a bolder face and ring a louder peal next time you come to the house of your father's old friend mr franz answered this warm greeting by a sickly smile and while he was being introduced to the family kept bowing on thinking of nothing but how to keep out of everybody's way he was tempted every five minutes of course to break out in his usual style and could have found it in his heart to chuck the whole party under the chin and take all the talk to himself but he could be determined enough when he chose and having determined to give his father's rule a fair chance he restrained himself to the utmost so not even the hearty reception of the old partner and his wife nor the smiling faces of either daughters or sons could lure him into opening out yes and no do you think so i dare say perhaps no doubt you're right and other such unmeaning little phrases were all he would utter when they talked to him how shy he is poor fellow thought the ladies and then they talked to him all the more one tried to amuse him with one subject another with another how did he like the public gardens were they not very pretty he scarcely knew no doubt they were if they thought so what did he think of the theatre it was very hot when he was there had he any friends in town he couldn't say friends he knew one or two people a little and the poor youth could hardly restrain a groan as he answered each of the questions then they chatted of books and music and dancing and pressed him hard to discover what he knew and could do and liked best and when it oozed out even from his short answers that he had read certain books in more than one language and could sing just a little and dance just a little and do several other things just a little too all sorts of nods and winks passed through the family and they said ah when you know us better and are not so shy of us as strangers we shall find out you are as clever again as you pretend to be my dear mr franz i'll tell you what added the old partner coming up at this moment it's a perfect treat to me mr franz to have a young man like you in my house you're your father over again and i can't praise you more he was the most modest unobtrusive man in all our town and yet knew more of his business than all of us put together no no i can't allow that cried the motherly wife nonsense replied the old partner however my dear boy for i really must call you so it was that very thing that made your father's fortune i mean that he was just as unpretending as he was clever everybody trusts an unpretending man and you'll make your fortune too in the same manner trust me before long now boys added he turning to his sons you hear what i say and mind you take the hint as for the young puppies of the present day who fancy themselves fit to sit in the chair of their elders as soon as ever they have learnt their alphabet and are for thrusting themselves forward in every company mr franz i'll own it to you because you will understand me i have no patience with such rude impertinent jackanapuses and always long to kick them downstairs the old partner stood in front of mr franz as he spoke and cleansed his fist in animation mr franz sat on thorns he first went hot and then he went cold he himself kicked downstairs as he listened he was ready to cry he was ready to fight he was ready to run away he was ready to drop on his knees and confess himself the most impertinent of all the impertinent jackanapuses race but he gulped and swallowed and shut his teeth close and nobody found him out only he looked very pale which the good mother soon noticed and said she to her husband my dear love 
don't you see how fagged and weary it makes mr franz look to hear you raving on about a parcel of silly lads with whom he has nothing in common you will frighten him out of his wits mr franz will forgive me i know cried the old partner gently jacintha my dear fetch the wine and the cake the kind careful souls feared he was delicate and insisted on his having some refreshment and then papa ordered the young people to give their guests some music and franz sat by while the sons and daughters went through a beautiful opera chorus which was so really charming that mr franz did forget himself for a while clapped violently and got half way through the word encore in a very loud tone but he checked himself instantly coloured apologised for his rudeness and retreated further back from the piano of course this new symptom of modesty was met by more kindness and followed by a sly hint from the merry jacintha that mr franz's turn for singing had come now poor mr franz with the recollection of the morning's adventure on his mind and his father's rule ringing in his ears he felt singing to be out of the question so he declined on which they entreated insisted and would listen to no refusal and jacintha went to him and looked at him with her sweetest smile and said but you know mr franz you said you could sing a little and if it's ever so little you should sing when you're asked and with that miss jacintha offered him her hand and led him to the piano franz was annoyed though he ought to have been pleased but how am i to keep out of people's way thought he to himself if they will pull me forward it is the oddest thing i ever knew i can't do right either way then a thought struck him i have no music miss jacintha said he and i can't sing without music and he was going back again to his chair in the corner but we all have the new music was her answer and she opened a portfolio at once see here's the last new song and she held one up before the unfortunate youth who at the sight of it coloured all over even to the tips of his ears whereupon miss jacintha who was watching him laughed and said she had felt sure he knew it and down she sat and began to play the accompaniment and in two minutes afterwards mr franz found himself in spite of himself as it were exhibiting in the song the fatal song of the morning adventure it was a song of tender sentiment and the singer's most tremulous voice added to the effect and a warm clapping of hands greeted its conclusion but by the time mr franz was so completely exhausted with the struggles of this first effort on the new plan that he began to wish them good night saying he would not intrude upon them any longer they would shake hands with him though he tried to bow himself off without and the old partner followed him downstairs into the hall mr franz said he we have been delighted to make your acquaintance but this has been only a quiet family party now we know your sort you must come again and meet our friends wife will fix the day and send you word and don't you be afraid young man mind you come and put your best foot forward among us all franz was almost desperate his conscience began to reproach him what was he going to accept all this kindness like a rogue receiving money under false pretences he was shocked and began to protest i assure you dear sir i don't deserve you are quite under a mistake i really am not the fact is you think a great deal better of me than nonsense shouted the old partner clapping him vigorously on the back why you're not going to teach me at this time of my life surely not going to turn as conceited as that after all eh come come mr franz no nonsense and to-morrow he added i'll send you letters of introduction to some of my friends who will show you the lions and make much of you you will be well received wherever you take them first for my sake and afterwards for your own there there i won't hear a word no thanks i hate them good night and the old partner fairly pushed mr franz through the door oh dear oh dear was the waiter's exclamation when franz reached the hotel 
and the light of the lamp shone on his white worn-out face oh dear oh dear i fear you've been a silly young gentleman over again what have you been doing this time i've been trying to keep out of everybody's way all the evening growled mr franz and they would pull me forward in spite of myself no really though cried the waiter as if it was scarcely possible really sighed poor mr franz then do me the honour sir exclaimed the waiter with a sudden deference of manner and taking the tips of franz's fingers in his own he bent over them with a salute you're a wise young gentleman now sir and your fortune's made i'm glad you've hit it at last and mr franz had hit it at last indeed continued aunt judy as appeared more plainly still by the letters of introduction which reached him next morning they were left open and were to this effect the bearer of this is the son of an old friend one of the most educated agreeable young men i ever saw as modest as he is well educated and i can't say more procure him some amusement that a little of his shyness may be rubbed off and forward his fortunes my dear friend as fast as you can franz handed one of these letters to his friend the waiter and the officious fellow grinned from ear to ear there is only one more thing to fear observed he and what asked franz why that now you're comfortable my dear young gentleman your head should be turned and you should begin to make yourself agreeable again and spoil all oh poor bother agreeable i say now as you did cried franz laughing no no my good friend i'm not going to make myself agreeable any more i know better than that at last then your fortune's safe as well as made was the waiter's last remark as he was about to withdraw but franz followed him to the door i found out a rather curious thing this evening do you know and that was inquired his humble friend why that i was sitting all the time in that very attitude my mother recommended with my head a little down you know so that i really don't think they noticed my snub the waiter got so far as oh pooh but franz was nervous and interrupted him yes yes i don't believe there's anything in it myself but it will be a comfort to my mother to think it was her advice that made my fortune which she will do when i tell her that ah the ladies will be romantic now and then exclaimed the waiter with a flourish of his hand and you must trim the comfort to a person's taste and in due time pursued aunt judy that was exactly what mr franz did strictly adhering to his father's rule and encouraged by its capital success that first night he got so out of the habit of being pert and foolish and inconsiderate that he ended by never having any wish to be so so that he became what the old partner had imagined him to be at first it was a great restraint for some time but his modest manners fitted him at last as easy as an old shoe and he was welcome at every house because he was never in the way and always knew when to retire it was a jovial day for papa and mamma's watchmaker when two days afterwards mr franz returned home a partner in the old partner's prosperous business and with the smiling jacintha for his bride and then in telling his mother of that first evening of good fortune he did not forget to mention that he had hung on his head all the time as she had advised and just as he expected she jumped up in the most extravagant delight i knew how it would be all along cried she i told you so i knew if you could only hide that terrible snub all would be well and i'm sure our pretty jacintha wouldn't have looked your way if you hadn't see now you have to thank your mother for it all franz was quite happy himself so he smiled and let his mother be happy her way too but he opened his heart of hearts to poor papa and told him well in fact all his follies and mistakes and their cure and if mamma was happy in her bit of comfort papa was not less so in his for there is not a more delightful thing in the world than for father and son to understand each other as friends and old franz would sometimes walk up and down in his room listening to the cheerful young voices upstairs 
and say to himself that if mother franz good soul as she was did not always quite enter into his feelings it was his comfort to be blessed with a son who did what a long story it had been aunt judy was actually tired out when she got to the end and could not talk about it but the little ones did till they arrived at the station and had to get out and in the evening when they were all sitting together before they went to bed there was no small discussion about the story of mr franz and how people were to know what was really good manners when to come forward and when to hold back and the children were a little startled at first when their mother told them that the best rules for good manners were to be found in the bible and when she reminded them of that text when thou art bidden go and sit down in the lowest room etc they saw in those words a very serious reason for not pushing forward into the best place in company and when they recollected that every man was to do to others as they wished others to do to him it became clear to them that it was the duty of all people to study their neighbour's comfort and pleasure as well as their own and it was no hard matter to show how this rule applied to all the little ins and outs of everyday life whether at home or in society and there were plenty of other texts ordering deference to elders and the modesty which arises out of that humility of spirit which wanteth not itself and is not puffed up there was moreover the comfortable promise that the meek should inherit the earth of course it was difficult to the little ones just at first just to see how such very serious words could apply to anybody's manners and specially to their own but it was a difficulty which mamma with a little explanation got over very easily and before the little ones went to bed they quite understood that in restraining themselves from teasing and being troublesome they were not only being tiresome but were actually obeying several gospel rules end of out of the way part two section seven nothing to do part one had i a little son i would christian him nothing to do charles lamb there is a complaint which is not to be found in the doctor's books but which is nevertheless such a common and troublesome one that one heartily wishes some physique could be discovered which would cure it it may be called the nothing to do complaint even quite little children are subject to it but they never have it badly parents and nurses have only to give them something to do or tell them of something to do and the thing is put right a puzzle or a picture book relieves the attack at once but after the children have overgrown puzzles and picture books and nurses and when even a parent's advice is received with a little impatience then the nothing to do complaint if it seizes them at all is a serious disease and often very difficult to cure and if not cured alas then follows the melancholy spectacle of grown-up men and women who are a plague to their friends and a weariness to themselves because living under the notion that there is nothing for them to do they want everybody else to do something to amuse them any one can laugh at the old story of the gentleman who got into such a fanciful state of mind hypochondriacal it is called that he thought he was his own umbrella and so on coming in from a walk would go and lay it in the easy chair by the fire while he himself went and leant up against the wall in a corner of the hall but this gentleman was not a bit more fanciful and absurd than the people whether young or old who look out of windows on rainy days and groan because there is nothing to do there is so much for everybody to do that most people leave half their share undone the oddest part of the complaint is that it generally comes on worst in those who from being comfortably off in the world and from having had a great deal of education have such a variety of things to do that one would fancy they could never be at a loss for a choice but these are the very people who are most afflicted it is always the young people who have books and leisure and music and drawing and gardens and pleasure grounds and villagers to be kind to who lounge to the rain bespattered windows on a dull morning and groan because there is nothing to do 
in justice to girls in general it should be here mentioned that they are on the whole less liable to the complaint than the young lords of the creation who are supposed to be their superiors in sense philosophers may excuse this as they please but the fact remains that there are few large families in england whose sisterhoods have not at times been teased half out of their wits by the growlings of its young gentlemen during the paroxysms of the nothing to do complaint growling being one of its most characteristic symptoms perhaps among all the suffering sisterhoods it would have been difficult to find a young lady less liable to catch such a disorder herself than aunt judy and perhaps that was the reason why she used to do such tremendous battle with number three whenever after his return from school for the holidays he happened to have an attack what are you groaning at through the window number three she inquired on one such occasion is it raining a very gruff sounding no was the answer number three not condescending to turn round as he spoke he proceeded however to state that it had rained when he got up and he supposed it would rain again as a matter of course for his especial annoyance being implied and he concluded it's so horribly slow here with nothing to do number six who was sitting opposite aunt judy doing a french exercise here looked up at her sister and perceiving a smile steal over her face took upon herself to think her brother's remark very ridiculous so said she with a saucy giggle i can find you plenty to do number three in a minute come and write my french exercise for me number three turned sharply round at this with a frown on his face which by no means added to its beauty and called out now miss pert i recommend you to hold your tongue i don't want any advice from a conceited little minx like you miss pert was extinguished at once and set to work at the french exercise again almost industriously and a general silence ensued but people in the nothing to do complaint are never quiet for long teasing is quite as constant a symptom of it as growling so number three soon came lounging from the window to the table and began i say judy i wish you would put those tiresome books and drawings and rubbish away and i think of something to do but it's the books and the drawings and the rubbish that give me something to do cried aunt judy you surely don't expect me to give them up and go arm in arm with you round the house bemoaning the slowness of our fate which gives us nothing to do shall we come i don't care i will if you like but which shall we complain to first mamma or the maids come which mamma or the maids while miss pert opposite was labouring with all her might to smother the laugh she dared not indulge in but number three pushed aunt judy testily away nonsense judy what has that to do with it it's all very well for you girls now miss pert mind your own affairs and don't stare at me to amuse yourself with all manner of follies of course cried aunt judy laughing don't be afraid of speaking out number three it's all very well for us girls to amuse ourselves with all manner of follies and nonsense and rubbish here aunt judy chucked the drawing book to the end of the table tossed a dictionary after it and threw another book or two in the air catching them as they came down while you superior sensible young man that you are born to be the comfort of your family be quiet interrupted number three trying to stop her but she ran round the table and proceeded and the enlightener of mankind can't no no number three i won't be stopped can't amuse yourself with anything because everything is so horribly slow there's nothing to do so you want to tie yourself to your foolish sister's apron string it's too bad shouted number three and a race round the table began between them but aunt judy dodged far too cleverly to be caught so it ended in their resting at opposite ends number six and her french exercises lying between them number six my dear cried aunt judy in the lull of exertion i proclaim a holiday from folly and rubbish put your books away and put your impertinence away too hold your tongue 
and don't be Miss Pest, and vanish as soon as you can. Miss Pert performed two or three putting away evolutions with the velocity of a sunbeam and darted off through the door. Now then, we'll be reasonable, observed Aunt Judy, and carrying a chair to the front of the fire, she sat down and motioned to number three to do the same, taking out from a pocket a little bit of embroidery work, which she kept ready for chatting hours. Number three was always willing to listen to Aunt Judy. He desired nothing better than to get her undivided attention and pour out his groans in her ear. So he sat down with a very good grace and proceeded to insist that there, was, that there never was anything so slow as it was. Aunt Judy wanted to know what it was, the place or the people, including herself, or what. Number three could explain it no other way than by declaring that everything was slow and there was nothing to do. Aunt Judy maintained that there was plenty to do, whereupon number three said, but nothing worth doing. Whereupon Aunt Judy told number three that he was just like Dr. Faustus, on which of course number three wanted to know what Dr. Faustus was like, and Aunt Judy answered that he was just like him, only a great deal older and very learned. Only quite different then, suggested number three. No, said Aunt Judy, not quite different, for he came one day to the same conclusion that you have done, namely, that there was nothing to do worth doing in the world. I don't say the world, I'd only say here, observed number three. There's plenty to do elsewhere, I dare say. So you think, because you have not tried elsewhere, answered Aunt Judy. But Dr. Faustus, who had tried elsewhere, thought everywhere alike, and declared there was nothing worth doing anywhere, although he had studied law, physic, divinity, and philosophy all through and knew pretty nearly everything. Then you see, he did not get much good out of learning, remarked number three. I do see, was the reply. And what became of him? At that point, replied Aunt Judy, and a very remarkable point too, as soon as he got into the state of fancying there was nothing to do worth doing in God's world, the evil spirit came to him and found him something to do in what I may, I am sure, called the devil's world. I mean, wickedness. Oh, that's a story written upon what sold him, exclaimed number three contemptuously. For Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Judy, I call that a regular cell. Not a bit of it, cried Aunt Judy warmly. I don't suppose the man who wrote the story ever saw Watts' hymns or intended to teach anything half as good. It's Mama's moral. She told me that she screwed it out of the story, though she doubted whether it was meant to be there. And what's the rest of the story then, inquired number three, whose curiosity was aroused. Well, when the old doctor found the world as it was, so slow as you very unmeaningly call it, he took to conjuring and talking with evil spirits by way of amusement, and then they easily persuaded him to be wicked, merely because it gave him something fresh and exciting to do. What's him again? I told you so, exclaimed number three, but the story's all nonsense from beginning to end. Nobody can conjure or talk to evil spirits in reality. So the whole thing is impossible, and where you find the moral, I don't know. Number three leant back and yawned as he concluded. He was rather disappointed that nothing more entertaining had come out of the story of Dr. Faustus. But Aunt Judy had by no means done. Impossible about conjuring and actually talking to evil spirits, certainly, said she. But spiritual influences, both bad and good, come to us all. No. Number three without bodily communion. So, for those who are inclined to feel like Dr. Faustus, there is both a moral and a warning in his fate. I don't know about what, cried number three. I think he was uncommonly stupid. After all, he had learnt to get into such a mess. Why, you yourself are always trying to make out. The more people labour and learn, the more sure they are to keep out of mischief. Now then, how do you account for the story of your friend, Dr. Faustus? Because, like King Solomon, he did not labor and learn in a right spirit or to the right end, replied Aunt Judy. 
lord bacon remarks that when after the creation god looked upon everything he had made behold it was very good whereas when man turned him about and took a view of the world and his own labours in it he found that all was vanity and vexation of spirit why did he come to such a different conclusion do you think i suppose because the world had got bad before king solomon's time suggested number three its inhabitants had replied aunt judy they had become subject to sin and misery but the world was still god's creation and proofs of the very good for which he had pronounced over it were to be found in every direction and even in fallen man if solomon had the sense or rather i should say good feeling to look for them ah number three there was plenty to be learnt and done that would not have ended in vanity and vexation of spirit if solomon had learnt in order to trace out the glory of god instead of establishing his own and if he had worked to create so far as was in his power a world of happiness for other people instead of seeking nothing but his own amusement if he had worked in the spirit of god in short but who can nobody exclaimed number three yes everybody who tries can to a certain extent said aunt judy it only wants the right feeling some of the godlike feeling which originated the creation of a beautiful world and caused the contemplation of it to produce the sublime complacency which is described and god looked upon everything he had made and behold it was very good it's a sermon judy cried number three half bored yet half amused at the notion of her preaching i'll set up a pulpit for you at once shall i no no be quiet number three exclaimed aunt judy i wish you would try and understand what i say well then said number three it appears to me that do what one might now the world has grown bad it would be impossible to pronounce that very good as a result of one's work there would always be something miserable and unsatisfactory at the end of everything i mean even if one really was to look into things closely and work for other people's good as you say there might be something miserable and unsatisfactory in the result certainly answered aunt judy but that it would all be vanity and vexation of spirit i deny our blessed saviour came into the world after it had grown bad remember and he worked solely for the restoration of the very good which sin had defaced it was undoubtedly miserable and unsatisfactory that he should be rejected by the very creatures he came to help but when he uttered the words it is finished the work which he had accomplished he might well have looked upon and called very good very very good even beyond the creation were that possible there can be no comparison between our saviour and us murmured number three no replied his sister but only let people work in the same direction and they will have more profit of their labour than king solomon ever owned to who had one fears only learnt in order to be learned and worked to please himself no man who employs himself in tracing out god's footsteps in the world or in working in god's spirit for the world will ever find such labours end in vanity and vexation of spirit solomon dr faustus and the grumblers have only themselves to thank for their disappointment very it's very curious observed number three getting up and stretching himself over the fire i mean about solomon and dr faustus but what can one do what can you or i do it's absurd to be fancying one can do good to one's fellow-creatures none the less there is one i want you to do good to at the present moment said aunt judy if it's not actually raining don't you remember what despair number one was in this morning when father sent her off on the pony in such a hurry ah oh, that pony that was just what i wanted myself interrupted number three exactly of course replied aunt judy but you were not the messenger father wanted so do not let us go all over that ground again pray the fact was number one had just heard that her pet tawny rachel was very ill and she wanted to go and see her and give her some good advice and i am to go instead now number three suppose you go instead of me and save me a wet walk number three of course began by protesting that it was not possible that he could do any good to an old woman 
old women were not at all in his way. He could only say, how do you do, and come away. Aunt Judy disputed this. She thought he could offer her some creature comforts, and ask whether she had seen the doctor, and what he said, as number one particularly wished to know. What an idea! No, no, he must decline inquiring what the doctor said. It would be absurd, but he could offer her something to eat. And just ask if she had had the doctor. Well, just that, and come away. It would not occupy many minutes, but he wished while Aunt Judy was about it, she had found him something rather longer to do. Aunt Judy promised to see what could be devised on his return, and number three departed, and a very happily chosen errand it was, for it happened in this case, as it so constantly does happen, that what was begun for other people's sake ended in personal gratification. Number three went to see Tawny Rachel, out of good-natured compliance with Aunt Judy's request, but found an interest and amusement in the visit itself, which he had not in the least expected. Ten, twenty, thirty minutes elapsed, and he had not returned, and when he did so at last, he burst into the house, far more like an avalanche than a young gentleman who could find nothing to do coming in the back way he ran into the kitchen and told the servants to get some hot water ready directly for he was sure something would be wanted then passing forward he shouted to know where his mother was and having found her entreated entreated she would order some comfortable gruelly stuff or other to be made for the sick old woman, particularly insisting that it should have ale or wine, as well as spice and sugar in it. He was positive that it was just what she ought to have. She had said how cold she was, and how glad she should be of something to warm her inside, and there was nobody to do anything for her at home. What a shame it was for a poor old creature like that to be left with only two dirty boys to look after her and they always at play in the street her daughter and husband were working out and she sat moaning over the fire from pain without any one to care tender-hearted and impulsive if thoughtless the spirit of number three had been moved with him within him at the spectacle of the gaunt old woman in this hour of her lonely suffering poor tawny rachel the children had called her so from the heroine of mrs hannah moore's tale because of those dark gypsy eyes of hers which had formerly given such a fine expression to a handsome but melancholy face melancholy because careworn from the long life struggle for daily bread for a large indulged family who scarcely knew at the day of her death that she had worn herself out for their sakes poor tawny rachel she was one day asked by a well-meaning shopkeeper of whom she had purchased a few goods where she thought she was going to tawny rachel turned her sad eyes upon her interrogator and made answer going to why where do you think i'm going to but to heaven deed where do you think i'm going to but to heaven she repeated to herself slowly as if to recover breath and then added I should like to know who heaven is for, if not for such as me, that have slaved all their lives through, for other folk. And so saying, Tawny Rachel turned round again, and went away. Poor Tawny Rachel, the theology was imperfect enough, but so had been her education and advantages, yet as surely as her scrupulous never-failing honesty and unmurmuring self-denial must have been inspired by something beyond human teaching so surely did it prove no difficult to lead her onwards to those simple verities of the christian faith which in her case seemed to solve the riddle of a weary unsatisfactory life and confiding in which the approach of death became to her the advent of the prince of peace but she had quite cheered up remarked number three at the notion of something comforting and good and so he had come off at once at once the exclamation came from aunt judy who had entered the room and was listening to the account why number three you must have been there an hour at least and nevertheless i dare say you have forgotten about the doctor 
the doctor cried number three laughing it's the doctor who has kept me all this time you never heard such fun in your life only he's an awful old rascal i must say mamma and aunt judy gazed at number three in bewilderment the respectable old village practitioner who had superintended all the diseases in the place for nearly half a century to be called an awful old rascal at last what could number three be thinking of certainly not of the respectable village practitioner as he soon explained by describing the arrival at tawny rachel's cottage of a travelling quack with a long white beard my dear number three exclaimed mamma mother dear i can't help it cried number three and proceeded to relate that while he was sitting with the old woman listening to the account of her aches and pains some one looked in at the door and asked if she wanted anything but before she could speak remarked how ill she seemed and said he could give her something to do her good judy added number three suddenly breaking off he looked just like dr faustus i'm sure never mind about that cried aunt judy tell us what tawny rachel said oh she called out that he must give it if she was to have it for she had nothing to pay for it with i had a shilling in my pocket and was just going to offer it when i recollected he would most likely do her more harm than good but the gentleman with the white beard walked in immediately set his pack down the table and said then my good woman i shall give it you and out he brought a bottle and tasted it before he gave it to her and promised her that it would cure her if she took it all my dear number three repeated mamma once more yes i know she can't be cured mother and i think she knows it too but still she took it very kind as she called it of him and asked him if he would like to rest him a bit by the fire and the gentleman accepted the invitation and there we all three sat for really i quite enjoyed seeing him and he began to warm his hands remarking that the young gentleman that was i you know looked very well oh judy i very nearly said thank you dr faustus but i only laughed and nodded and really did hold my tongue and then the two began to talk and it was as good as any story you ever invented aunt judy tawny rachel was very inquisitive and asked him you've come a long way sir i suppose yes ma'am i'm a great traveller and i have been so a many years it's a wonder you have not settled before now i might have settled ma'am a many times ah when folks once began wandering they can't settle down you were maybe brought up to it i was brought up to something a great deal better than that ma'am you was sir it's a pity i'm sure my father was physician to queen elizabeth ma'am a many years when number three arrived at this point of the dialogue mamma and aunt judy both exclaimed at once and the former repeated once more the expostulatory my dear number three which delighted number three who proceeded to assure him that he had himself interrupted the travelling quack here by suggesting that it was queen charlotte he meant old queen charlotte you know judy that number one was telling the children about the other day but the gentleman as number three called him had turned very red at the doubt thus thrown on his accuracy and put a rather threatening croak into his voice and said asking your pardon young gentleman i know what i'm saying and it was queen elizabeth and not charlotte nor anybody else number three described that he had felt it best after this to hold his tongue and say no more so tawny rachel put in her word and remarked it was a wonder the queen hadn't made their fortunes on which the gentleman turned rather red again and said that the queen did make their fortune but wouldn't let them keep it for fear they should be too great and too rich that was it this statement required a little explanation but the gentleman was ready with all particulars the queen used to pay his father by hundreds of pounds at a time because that was due to him but being jealous of his having so much money she always set some one to take it away from him as he left the place so that was the reason why there was no fortune put by for him after his father died and that was the reason why he couldn't very well settle at first though everybody wished him to stay and so 
he took to travelling for his father had left him all his secrets and he was qualified to practise anywhere and had cured some thousands of sick folks up and down number three declared that he had not made the old man's account of himself a bit more unconnected than it really was and on the whole it sounded very imposing to poor tawny rachel who watched his departure with a sort of respectful awe number three added that not liking to curb her faith either in the man or the bottle he had himself helped her to the first dose and had then begun to talk about the creature comforts before described the very mention of which seemed to cheer the old lady's heart and to interest her at least as much as the biography of the travelling quack so now mother concluded he order the gruel and we'll give three cheers for queen elizabeth and dr faustus eh judy but i do think the poor old thing ought not to take that man's poisonous rubbish so here's my shilling and welcome if you'll give some more and let us send for a real doctor the nothing to do morning had nearly slipped away between the conversation with aunt judy and the visit to tawny rachel and when soon after a friend called to take number three on a fossil hunt and he had to snatch a hasty morsel before his departure he declared he was like the poor governess in the song who was sure to find out with attention and zeal that she'd scarcely have time to partake of a meal there was so much to do but you're a capital fellow judy he added kissing her and you'll tell me a story when i come back and off he ran shutting his ears to aunt judy's declaration that she only told stories to the little ones nor would she on his return and during the cosy evening nothing to do hour consent to devote herself on this especial amusement only so after arguing the point for a time he very wisely yielded and declared at last that he would be a little one too and listen to a little one's story if aunt judy would tell one End of nothing to do part one nothing to do part two it was rather late when this was settled and the little ones had stayed upstairs to play at a newly invented game bazaars in the nursery but when number three strode in with the announcement of the story there was a shout of delight followed by the old noisy rush downstairs to the dining room it is not a bad thing to be a little one now and then in spirit people would do very well to try and be so oftener who that has looked upon a picture of himself as a little one has not wished that he could be restored to the little one's spirit the little one's innocence the little one's hopeful trust of such is the kingdom of heaven and though none of us would like to live our lives over again lest our errors should be repeated and so doubled in guilt all of us at the sight of what we once were would fain very fain if we could lie down to sleep and awake a little one again never perhaps is the sweet mercy of an early death brought so closely home to our apprehension as when the grown-up careworn man looks upon the image of himself as a child happily however nay more than happily mercifully the grown-up man if he do but put on the humility may gain something of the peace of a little one's heart aunt judy had twisted up a roll of muslin for a turban on her head by the time they came down for said she this is to be an eastern tale and i shall not be inspired that is to say i shall not get on a bit unless there is a costume and manners to correspond so you three little ones squat yourselves down turkish fashion on the floor with your legs tucked under you there now that's something like and i begin to feel myself in the east nevertheless i am rather glad there is no critical eastern traveller at hand listening through the keyhole to my blunders however errors excepted here is the wonderful story of the king of the hills and his four sons a great many years ago in a country which cannot be traced upon the maps but which lies somewhere between the great rivers indus and euphrates lived selim king of the hills his riches were unlimited his palaces magnificent and his dresses and jewels of the most costly description 
he never condescended to wear a diamond unless it was inconveniently large for his fingers and the fiery opals which adorned his turban like those in the mineral room at the british museum shimmered and blazed in such a surprising manner that people were obliged to lower their eyes before the light of them powerful as well as rich king skeleen could have anything in the world he wished for but such is the perversity of human nature he cared very little for anything except smoking his pipe of which to say the truth he was so fond that he would have been well contented to have done nothing else all day long it seemed to him the nearest approach to the sublimest of all ideas of human happiness the having nothing to do he caused his four sons to be brought up in luxurious ease his wish for them being that they should remain ignorant of pain and sorrow for as long a period of their lives as was possible so he built a palace for them at the summit of one of his beautiful hills where nothing disagreeable or distressing could ever meet their eyes and he gave orders to their attendants that they should never be thwarted in anything every wish of their hearts therefore was gratified from their baby days but so far from being in consequence the happiest they were the most discontented children in his dominions from the first year of their birth king skeleen had never been able to smoke his pipe in peace there were always messages coming from the royal nursery to the smoking-room asking for something fresh for the four young princes who were owing to some mysterious cause incapable of enjoying any of their luxurious indulgences for more than a few hours together at first these incessant demands for one thing or another for the children surprised and annoyed their papa considerably but by degrees he got used to it and took the arrival of the messengers as a matter of course the very nurses began it may it please your majesty the young princes your majesty's incomparable sons may their shadows never be less are tired of their jewelled rattles and have thrown them on the floor doubtless they would like india rubber rings with bells better then get them india rubber rings with bells was all king skelim said and turned to his pipe again and so it went on perpetually until one day it came to may it please your majesty the young princes your majesty's incomparable sons may their shadows never be less have thrown their hobby horses into the river and want to have live ponies instead at the first moment the king gave his usual answer then get them live ponies instead from a sort of mechanical habit but the words were scarcely uttered when he recalled them this request awoke even his sleepy soul out of its smoke dream and inquiring into the ages of his sons and finding that they were of years to learn as well as to ride he dismissed their nurses placed them in the hands of tutors and procured for them the best masters of every description for said he what saith the proverb kings govern the earth but wise men govern kings my sons shall be wise as well as kingly and then they shall govern themselves and after settling this so cleverly king skelim resumed his pipe in the confident hope that now at last he should smoke it in peace for said he when my sons shall become wise through learning they will be more moderate in their desires i do not know whether his majesty's incomparable sons relished this change from nurses to tutors but on that particular point they were allowed no choice so if they bemoaned themselves in their palace on the hill their father knew nothing of it and so often the disagreeableness of the restraint which learning imposes king skelim gave more strict orders than ever that provided the young gentlemen only learnt their lessons well every whim that came into their heads should be complied with soon as expressed in spite of all his ingenious arrangements however the royal father did not enjoy the amount of repose he expected all was quiet enough during lesson hours it is true but as soon as ever that period had elapsed the young princes became as restless as ever nay the older they grew the more they wanted and the less pleased they became with what was granted from the very early days of the tutorship the old story began may it please your majesty the young princes your majesty's incomparable sons may their shadows never be less 
are tired of their ponies and want horses instead the king was a little disappointed at this and actually laid down his pipe to talk is anything the matter with the ponies he asked may it please your majesty no only that your incomparable sons call them slow spirited lads thought the king quite consoled and gave the answer as usual then get them horses instead and when only a few days afterwards he was informed that his incomparable sons had wearied of their horses because they were slow and wished to ride on elephants instead his majesty began to feel disturbed in mind and wonder what would come next and how it was that the teaching of the tutors did not make his sons more moderate in their desires nevertheless said he what saith the proverb thou a man and lackest patience and again early ripe early rotten early wise soon forgotten my sons are but children yet after which reflection he returned to his pipe as before and disturbed himself as little as possible when messenger after messenger arrived to announce the fresh vagaries of the young princess it is impossible to enumerate all the luxuries amusements and delights they asked for obtained and wearied off during several years but the longer it went on the more hardened and indifferent their father became for said he what saith the proverb the longest lane turns at last at last my sons will have everything man can wish for and then they will cease from asking and i shall smoke my pipe in peace one day however the messenger entered the royal smoking-room in a greater hurry than ever and was about to commence his usual elaborate peroration respecting the incomparable sons when his majesty held up his hand to stop him and called out what is it now may it please your majesty your majesty's in what is it they want cried the king interrupting him may it please your majesty something to do something to do repeated the perplexed king of the hills something to do when half the riches of my empire have been expended upon providing them with the means of doing everything in the world that was delightful to the soul of man surely o oh son of a dog thou art laughing at my beard to come to me with such a message from my sons nevertheless may it please your majesty i have spoken but the truth your majesty's in hush with that nonsense interrupted the king your majesty's sons in fact then have sickened and pined for three mortal days because they have got nothing to do now then my sons are mad exclaimed poor king skelim laying down his pipe and rising from his recumbent position and it is time that i bestir myself and thereupon he summoned his attendants and sent for the royal hakim that is to say physician and the most learned and experienced dervish that is to say religious teacher of the neighbourhood for said he who knows whether this sickness is of the body or the soul and having explained to them how he had brought up his children the indulgences with which he had surrounded them the learning which he had instilled into them and the way in which he had preserved them from every annoying sight and sound he concluded what more could i have done for the happiness of my children than i have done and how is it that their reason has departed from them so that they are at a loss for something to do speak one or other of you and explain then the dervish stepped forward and opening his mouth began to make answer and said he o king of the hills in the bringing up of thy sons surely thou hast forgotten the proverb which saith he that would know good manners let him learn from him who hath them not and even so may the wise man say of happiness he that would know he is happy must learn it from him who is not but again doth not another proverb say will thy candle burn less brightly for lighting mine wherefore the happiness which a man has when he has discovered it he is bound to impart to those that have it not have i spoken well then the king and the hakim declared he had spoken remarkably well nevertheless i am by no means sure that king Shalim knew what he meant whereupon the dervish offered to go at once to the four incomparable princes 
and cure them of their madness in supposing they had nothing to do and king shalim in great delight and thoroughly glad to be rid of the trouble told him that he placed his sons entirely in his hands then taking him aside he addressed to him a parting word in confidence thou knowest o wise dervish that i have had no education myself and therefore as the proverb hath it to say i don't know is the comfort of my life yet what better is a learned man than a fool if he comes but to this conclusion at last see thou restore wisdom and something to do to the souls of my sons which the dervish promised to accomplish accordingly in company with the hakim he betook himself to the palace of the four princes his majesty's incomparable sons well in spite of all they had heard both the dervish and hakim were surprised at what they really found at the palace of the four princes it was as if everything that human ingenuity could devise for the gratification amusement and occupation both of body and mind had been here brought together horses elephants chariots creatures of every description for hunting riding driving and all sorts of sport were there countless in numbers and perfect in kind gardens pleasure grounds woods flowers birds and fountains to delight the eye and ear while within the palace were sources of still deeper enjoyment the songs of the poets and the wisdom of the ancients reposed there upon golden shelves musicians held themselves in readiness to pour exquisite melodies upon the air games exercises indoor sports in every variety could be commanded in a moment and attendants waited in all directions to fulfil their young master's will the poor old dervish and hakim looked at each other in fresh amazement at every step they took and neither of them could find a proverb to fit so extraordinary a case at last after a long walk through chambers and antechambers without end hung round with mirrors and ornaments they reached the apartment of the young princes where they found the four incomparable creatures lounging on four ottomans sighing their hearts out because they had nothing to do as the door opened the eldest prince glanced languidly around and inquired if the messenger had returned from their father and being answered that the dervish and hakim who now stood before him were messengers from their father he called out to know if the old gentleman had sent them anything to do the king your father's spirit is disturbed with anxiety answered the dervish lest some sudden calamity should have deprived his sons of the use of their limbs or their senses or lest their attendants should have failed to provide them with everything the earth affords delightful to the soul of man the king our father's spirit is disturbed with smoke replied the eldest prince or he never would have sent such an old fellow as you with such an answer as that what's the use of the use of one's limbs or one's senses or all the earth affords delightful to the soul of man if we are sick of it all just go back and tell him we've got everything and are sick of everything and can do everything and don't care to do anything because everything is so slow so we will trouble him to find us something fresh to do there is that clear enough old gentleman the king your father answered the dervish has provided against even that emergency i am come to tell you of something fresh to see and to do no sooner had the dervish uttered these words than the four princes jumped up from the ottoman in the most lively and vigorous manner and clamoured to know what it was expressing their hope that it was a jolly lark in answer to which the dervish lifting himself up in a commanding manner stretched out his arm and exclaimed in a solemn voice young men you have exhausted happiness nothing new remains in the world for you but misery and want follow me there was something so unusual about the tone of his address and it was uttered in so imposing a manner that the young princes were as it were taken by storm and they followed the dervish and hakim without a word of inquiry or objection and he led them away from the palace on the beautiful hill away from all the sights and sounds that were collected together there to delight the soul of man with both bodily and intellectual enjoyment down into the city in the valley among the close-packed habitations of common men congregated there to labour and just exist and then die
and presently the dervish and the hakim spoke together and then the hakim led the way through a gloomy by-street till he came to a habitation into which he entered and the rest followed without a word and there stretched upon a pallet wasted and worn with pain lay a youth scarcely older than the young princes themselves the lower part of whose body was wrapped round with bandages and who was unable to move the hakim proceeded at once to unloosen the fastenings and to examine the limbs of the sufferer they had been crushed by a frightful accident while working for his daily bread in the quarries of marble near the palace on the hill is there no hope my father he ejaculated in agony as the bruised thighs were exposed to the light revealing a spectacle from which the princess turned horrified away but the dervish stood between them and the door and motioned them back is there no hope repeated the youth shall i never again tread the earth in the freedom of health and strength never again climb the mountain side to taste the sweet breath of heaven never again even step across this narrow room to look forth into the narrow street sobs of distress here broke from the speaker and covering his face with his hands he awaited the hakim's reply but while the latter bent down to whisper his answer the dervish addressed himself to the trembling princess learn here at last said he the value of those limbs the power of using which you took upon with such thankless indifference as it is with this youth to-day so may it be with you to-morrow if the decree goes forth from on high bid me not again return to your father to tell him you are weary of a blessing the loss of which could overwhelm you with despair the young princes continued aunt judy were as their father had said but children yet that is to say although they were fourteen or fifteen years old they were childish in not having reflected or learned to reason but they were not hard-hearted at bottom their tenderness for others had never been called out during their life of self-indulgence but the sight of this young man's condition whom they personally knew as one who had at times been permitted to come up and join in their games overpowered them with dismay they entreated the hakim to say if nothing could be done and when he told them that a nurse and better food and the discourse of a wise companion were all essential for the recovery of the patient there was not to say the truth one among them who was not ready with promises of assistance and even offers of personal help whose distress seemed to receive a sudden calm from the sympathy the young princess betrayed the hakim led the way to another part of the town where he entered a house of rather better description in a small room of which they found a pale middle-aged man who was engaged in making a coarse sort of netting for trees hearing the noise of the entrance he looked up and asked who it was but with no change of countenance or apparent recognition of any one there but as soon as the hakim had uttered the words it is i a gleam of delight stole over the pale face and the man rising from his chair stretched out his arms to the hakim entreating him to approach and then the young princess saw that the pale man was blind is there any change o cassian inquired the hakim kindly none my father answered the blind man in a subdued tone but shall i murmur at what is appointed surely not in vain was the privilege granted me of transcribing the manuscripts which repose on the golden shelves in the palace of the royal princes surely not in vain did i gather from the treasures of ancient wisdom and the divine songs of the poets sources of consolation for the suffering children of men has any one been of late to read to you asked the hakim but this inquiry the blind man seemed scarcely able to answer big tears gathered into the sightless eyes and folding his hands across his bosom he murmured out none o oh my father not to every one it is permitted to trace the characters of light in which the wise have recorded their wisdom i alone of my family knew the secret i alone suffer now but shall i not submit to this also with a cheerful spirit it is written and it behoves me to submit and with tears streaming over his cheeks the blind man took up the netting which he had laid aside and forced himself to the work 
"'Seest thou?' exclaimed the dervish, turning to the prince who stood next him, apparently absorbed in contemplating the scene. "'Seest thou how precious are the powers thou hast wearied of in the springtime of life? "'How dear are the opportunities thou hast not cared to delight in? "'Bid me not again return to the king your father, "'to tell him his sons can find no pleasure in blessings, "'the deprivation of which they themselves would feel "'to be shutting out the sun from the soul.' then the young prince to whom the dervish addressed himself wept bitterly and begged to be allowed to visit the blind man from time to time and read to him out of the manuscripts that reposed on the golden shelves in the palace on the hill and which he now learnt for the first time had been transcribed for his use and that of his brothers by the skill of the sufferer before him and when the blind man clasped his hands over his head and would have prostrated himself on the ground in gratitude to him who spoke asking who the charitable pitier of the afflicted could be the prince embraced him as if he had been his brother forced him back gently into his seat and bidding him await him at that hour on the morrow followed the hakim from the house and now the dervish and hakim spoke together once again and the place they visited next was of a very different description enclosed within walls and limited in extent because in the outskirts of a populous town the garden into which they presently entered was though but as a drop in comparison with the ocean no unworthy rival of the gorgeous pleasure grounds of the palace there too the roses unfolded themselves in their glory to the sun tiny fountains scattered their cooling spray around and singing birds suspended on overshadowing trees of this scene of miniature beauty a venerable was perceived seated under the shadow of an arbor in front of a table on which were scattered manuscripts papers parchments and dried plants and in one corner of which were laid a set of tablets and writing materials although the door by which they entered had fallen to with a noise as they passed through the old man did not seem to be aware of it nor did he notice their presence until they came so near that their shadows fell on some of the papers on the table then indeed he looked suddenly up and a smile and gesture of delight bade them welcome it was not difficult to divine that the old man had lost the sense of hearing and the dervish taking up the tablets from the table wrote upon them the following words which he showed to the young princes before presenting them to him for whom they were intended hast thou not wearied yet o brother of thy narrow garden and the ever-recurring succession of flowers and thy study of the secrets of nature whereat the deaf man smiled again and wrote upon the tablets can any one weary of tracing out the skilful providence of the divine mind is it not a world within a world o my brother and inexhaustible in itself the youngest prince pressed forward to read the answer and having read it turned to the dervish and said ask him why the singing birds are suspended in the garden whose voices he cannot hear write on the tablet my son said the dervish and when he had written it the old man answered in the same manner as before i would remember my infirmity my son lest my soul should be tied to the beauties of the visible world but now when i see the twittering bills of the feathered songsters i remember that one sense has departed and that the other must follow and i prepare myself for death trusting that those who have rejoiced in the divine mind however imperfectly here may rejoice yet more hereafter when no sense or power shall be wanting after this the venerable old man led them to a secluded corner of the garden where his young son was instructing one portion of a glass of children from the secrets of his father's manuscripts while another set of youngsters were engaged in cultivating flowers by regular instruction and rule many a bright cheerful face looked up at the old man and his visitors as they passed but no one seemed to wish or leave his work or his lesson or the kind young tutor who ruled among them we have wasted our lives o my father exclaimed the young princess as they passed from this sight tell us may we not come back again here to learn true wisdom from this man and his son having obtained the old man's willing consent to his the hakim retired conducting his companions back into the streets and the young princes whose eyes were now open to the instruction they were receiving came up to the dervish and said 
Oh, why is the wish? We have learned the lesson you would teach, and we know now that it is but a folly, and a mockery, and a lie, when a man says that he has nothing to do. There is enough to do for all men, if their minds are directed right. Have I not spoken well? Thou hast spoken well according to thy knowledge, answered the dervish, but thou hast yet another lesson to learn. The prince was silenced, and the dervish and Hakim hurried forward to a still different part of the city, where several trades were carried on, and where in one place they came upon an open square, about which a number of gaunt, wild-looking men were lounging or sitting, unoccupied, listless, and sad. "'This is wrong, my father, is it not?' inquired one of the princes. But the dervish, instead of answering him, addressed a man who was standing somewhat apart from the others, and inquired why he was loitering there in idleness, instead of occupying himself in some honest manner. The man laughed a bitter mocking laugh, and turning to his companions, shouted out, "'Hear what the wise man asks. When trade has failed, and no one wants our labour, he asks us why we stand idling here. Then, facing the dervish, he continued, Do you not know, can you not see, O teacher of the blind, that we have got nothing to do? Nothing to do, he repeated with a loud cry. Nothing to do with hearts willing to work and hands able to work. Here he stretched out his bared muscular arms to the dervish, and wife and children calling out for food. Give us something to do, thou preacher of virtue and industry, he concluded, throwing himself on the ground in anguish, or at any rate, cease to mock us with the solemn inquiry of a fool. Oh, my father, my father, cried the young princes, pressing forward. This is the worst, the very worst of all. All things can be borne, but this dire reality of having nothing to do, let us find them something to do. Let us tear up our gardens, plough up our lawns, and pleasure grounds, so that we do but find work for these men, and save their children and wives from hunger, and themselves from crime, added the dervish solemnly. Then quitting his companions, he went into the crowd of men, and made known to them in a few hurried words, that by the order of their young princes, there would, before another day had dawned, be something found to do for them all. The cheer of gratitude which followed this announcement thrilled through the hearts of those who had been enabled to offer the boon, and so empowered them that after a liberal distribution of coin to the necessitous labourers, they gladly hurried away. Now my task is ended, cried the dervish, as they retraced their steps to the palace on the hill. My sons, you have seen the sacred sorrow which may attach to the bitter complaint of having nothing to do henceforth seal your lips over the words for in all other cases but this they are as you yourselves have said a folly a mockery and a lie it is scarcely necessary to add continued aunt judy that the young princes returned to the palace in a very different state of mind from that in which they left it they had now so many things to do in prospect so much to plan and inquire about that when the night closed upon them, they wondered how the day had gone, and grudged the necessary hours of sleep. But on the morrow, just as they were eagerly recommencing their left-off consultations, the dervish appeared among them, and suggested that their first duty still remained unthought of. The incomparable sons were now really surprised, for they had been flattering themselves they were most laudably employed. But the dervish reminded them, that although their duty to mankind in general was great, their duty to their father in particular was yet greater, and that it behoved them to set his mind at rest, by assuring him that henceforth they would not prevent him from smoking his pipe in peace, by restless discontent and disturbing messages and wants. To this the young princes readily agreed, and thoroughly ashamed on reflection of the years of Harris which, with which they in their thoughtless ingratitude had worried poor king selim they repaired to his presence and without entering into unnecessary explanations which he would not have understood assured him that they were perfectly happy that they had got plenty to do as well as everything to enjoy that they were very sorry they had tormented him for so long a period of his life but that they begged to be forgiven and would never do so again 
King Shalim was uncommonly pleased with what they said, although he had to lay down his pipe for a few minutes to receive their salutations, and give his in return, after which they returned to their palace on the hill, and led thenceforth useful, intelligent, and therefore happy lives, reforming grievances, consoling sorrows, and taking particular care that everybody had the opportunity of having something to do. And as they never again disturbed their father King Skelim with foolish messages, he spoke to his pipe in peace to the end of his days. Nice old Skelim, observed number eight, when Aunt Judy's pause showed that the story was done. A conclusion which made the other little ones laugh. But now Aunt Judy spoke again. You like the story, all of you? Could there be a doubt about it? No. Skelim, king of the hills, and his four sons, was one of Aunt Judy's very, very, very best inventions. But they had the happy knack of always thinking so of the last they heard. And yet there is a flaw in it, said Aunt Judy. Aunt Judy? exclaimed several voices at once, in a tone of expostulation. Yes, I mean in the moral, pursued she. There is no Christianity in the teaching, and therefore it is not perfect, although it is all very good as far as it goes. But they were Eastern people, and I suppose Mahometans or Brahmins, suggested number four. Exactly, and therefore I could not give them Christian principles. And therefore, although I have made my four princes turn out very well, and do what was right for the rest of their lives, as I had a right to do, yet it is only proper I should explain that I do not believe any people can be depended upon for doing right, except when they live upon Christian principles, and are helped by the grace of God to fulfil his will, as revealed to us by his Son, Jesus Christ. Certainly it is always more reasonable to do right than wrong, even when the wrong may seem most pleasant at the moment, because, as all people of sense know, doing right is most for their own happiness as well as for everybody else's, even in this world. But although the knowledge of this may influence us when we are in a sober enough state of mind to think about it calmly, the inducement is not a sufficiently strong one to be relied upon as a safeguard when storms of passion and strong temptations come upon us. In such cases, it very often goes for nothing, and then it is a perfect chance which way a person acts. Even in the matter of doing good to others, we need the Christian principle as our motive, or we may be often tempted to give it up, or even be as cruel at some moments, as we are kind at others. It is very pleasant, no doubt, to do good and be charitable when the feeling comes into the heart, but the mere pleasure is apt to cease if we find people thankless or stupid, and that our labours seem to have been in vain. And what a temptation there is, then, to turn away in disgust unless we are acting upon Christ's commands, and can bear in mind that even when the pleasure ends, the duty remains. And now Aunt Judy said in conclusion, a kiss for the storyteller all round, if you please. She has had an invitation, and is going from home tomorrow. Oh, Aunt Judy, ejaculated the little ones in not the most cheerful of tones, well cried aunt judy looking at them and laughing you don't mean to say that you will not find plenty to do and plenty to enjoy while i am away come i mean to write to you all by turns and i shall inquire in my letters whether you have remembered to your edification the story of shalim king of the hills and his four sons end of nothing to do part two End of Aunt Judy's Tales by Mrs. Alfred Gatty by Margaret Gatty